Hello, everyone. Welcome to our workshop on self-supervised robot learning. We are really excited to organize this workshop in, co in cooperation with um, Alice Freiburg, um, Brain Links, Brain Tools of University of Freiburg, as well as Google Research. Um, so let's get started with a brief introduction on self-supervised learning. Um, self-supervised learning is an exciting research direction that aims to learn representations from data itself without explicit and potentially even manual supervision. And um, one of the major, major benefits of self-supervised learning is the ability to scale to large amounts of unlabeled data in a lifelong learning manner and to improve the performance by reducing the effect of any data set bias. And recent development in self-supervised learning has, has resulted in achieving comparable or even better performance than fully supervised models. However, many of these methods are still developed in domain-specific communities, such as robotics, computer vision, or reinforcement learning. And the aim of this workshop is now to bring together researchers from diverse communities to discuss opportunities and challenges, and as well as to um, explore new research directions. So um, let's look at the format of today's workshop. So we have seven invited talks. Each of the talks would be 18 minutes each. We are streaming live on YouTube. Our YouTube feed would approximately be 20 seconds delay from our um, Zoom feed. Uh, so please keep that in mind when you ask questions. Um, attendees can post questions both on YouTube Live as well as Slack, um, which can also be accessed from RSS um, feed loop channel. We will have two moderated panel discussion sessions with the invited speakers where um, we, the moderators will basically ask questions that are pre-collected as well as live questions from Slack and YouTube. In case you haven't joined Slack, you can still join it at um, rss2020-ssrl.slack.com. All right, so we have seven invited speakers. Um, Dita Fox from University of Washington and NVIDIA, Peter Abil from UC Berkeley, Avinav Gupta from CMU and FAIR, um, Roberto Calendra from Facebook AI again, uh, Chelsea Finn from Stanford, Pierre Simonet from Google Brain, and Andy Zhang from Google Brain. So in total, we have eight um, contributed papers. This amounts to an acceptance rate of 47% in this workshop. We already have the pre-recorded talks online on our workshop website. So in case you haven't taken a look at it, you can still go online after this workshop and the videos will still be there. So we do have a best paper award in cooperation with Google Research. And at the end of this workshop, we will announce their award winner. Um, as for the contributed papers, we have two moderated contributor paper discussions. And once again, the questions will be um, taken from our pre-collected questions as well as live questions from YouTube and Slack. Um, and in these discussions, we also encourage participants to um, also uh, ask questions directly if you are on uh, Zoom or RSS feed loop. Okay, let's briefly take a look at today's schedule. Um, so we have three uh, invited talks and then we have a panel discussion with uh, the first panel discussion we'll have Tita Fox, Abhinav Gupta, um, Pierre Samanet, and it will be moderated by Wolfram Brogard. We then have a short, very short coffee break of five minutes. And then we have four invited talks. Um, uh, sorry, then we have our uh, contributed paper discussion in which we will have four um, contributed paper discussions about four papers. And then we have four invited talks of Roberto, Chelsea, Peter, and Andy, Andy Zhang. And then again, we'll have a short five minute break and which is followed by a panel discussion with um, the four invited speakers before. And this panel will be moderated by Anelia. We then have the last contributed paper discussion, which is again, four papers. And finally, uh, we'll, we'll conclude the workshop with remarks and um, the best paper award. All right, so in with this, um, I guess we can begin with um, the first invited talk. I guess that should be me. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Here. Okay, so our first speaker is Dita Fox, who has pioneered many contributions to probabilistic state estimation, RGBD perception, and machine learning and robotics. He's a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, and since 2007, also a senior director of robotics research at NVIDIA, where he's bridging the academic and industrial robotics research. With that, um, Dieter, we will give you controls and we're excited to hear your talk. I think you have to first, yes, exactly. All right. Let's see. Okay. Can you see everything? A quick feedback, everything coming through? Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah, hi, thank you very much for, for having me in this workshop. It's certainly a, a super exciting topic right now, self-supervised learning. We see a lot of that work going on in the computer vision community. And also, of course, as we will certainly see in some of the other talks, a lot of work in robotics, um, also for tasks like manipulation. Um, I want to give a, a brief overview of two pieces of work that we've done in, in that domain. And um, I think in contrast to some of the other work that we've seen, for example, where it's about learning to, to pick up objects from clutter that are more aimed at um, learning, let's say, um, classification systems with uh, weak supervision. What I want to uh, look at is techniques that, can, that robots can use to provide actually um, pretty accurate supervision for their um, visual uh, uh, tasks that might come after that. Um, and there's specifically, there's uh, two lines of work. I'm sure some of you might have heard of that, where the first is where we use um, dense 3D mapping in order to provide training data so that we can learn good visual descriptors. Um, that is work that was driven by, by Tanner Schmidt. And then some recent work um, where we want to enable a robot to generate its own training data so that it can do a better job at object pose estimation so that it can then do manipulation, for example, on objects. And there the focus is really um, to kind of also bridge the gap between pre-trained simulation data and um, the real world data that it then sees. Okay, so let me come to the first part. Um, and this is again on the idea uh, that we have very good model-based approaches for let's say 3D mapping, right? Where you take sequences of sensor data and then we can use things like Kinect fusion, uh, dynamic fusion, elastic fusion, there's many different techniques out there, but we can generate consistent 3D models of environments and even of, um, of objects that deform during the mapping process. Um, and uh, these techniques mostly leverage a lot of kind of um, geometric reasoning, uh, model-based reasoning inside in order to kind of incorporate these data streams over time into consistent models. And they're extremely good at these short-term correspondences, which means they can take a frame um, and match it very accurately into the map that they've built so far um, but they can only do so if, for example, the change in the camera position isn't too drastic. Okay? And that is where the learning comes in because um, larger scale matching processes like loop closures are so required typically um, uh, uh, learn feature representations or feature representations such as SIFT. Okay? And coming from that idea, uh, what Monsieur Tanner and then in collaboration with Richard Newcomb came up with is this idea that if we can build a Kinect Fusion model, for example, of an environment, uh, you see this here in the middle, and we take two frames that were observed during that mapping process, then what we can do is we can take a pixel from frame i, match it into the map, because the map was built from that frame as part of the data as well, and reproject it back into frame j, and through that process, we can take any pair of images and say which pixel in frame i belongs or looks at the same point in the world as the pixel in prime J, okay? We can do this throughout the full mapping process. So what that gives us is now suddenly um, correspondences between points 
that were not um, consecutive in the image data, but that could be uh, pretty far away in, in the mapping process because of this intermediate 3D consistent representation. We can do the same thing um, even for a more complex setting. In this case, it's kind of a dynamic fusion model. This is tenor and we can do the same kind of approach where we um, can associate pixels from the left with pixels on the right, okay? And um, now that we have these nice kind of um, dense correspondences between those images and even individual pixels, we can feed that into an approach in this case, and it's contrastive learning where we train a deep network. Um, here on the right, for example, the network structure that, that Tanner used in his uh, uh, approach, but there's various alternatives out there and um, the, the, the detail is not really important. But what we can do is we can train a network so that you um, feed into the network two images and um, it learns an embedding for each pixel in these images such that the embedding of two pixels that look at the same point in the 3D world should be very similar whereas embeddings for pixels that look at different points in the world are um, dissimilar, okay? And this can be trained through this contrastive gloss. There's uh, other ways of doing triplet gloss, uh, different combinations, and also developments of making this more efficient, but the idea is always kind of more or less the same. So the key thing is now that we can learn pixel embeddings um, that abstract away things like uh, viewpoint changes, changes in lighting conditions, and also in this case of the dynamic fusion changes in deformations and even um, on clothing. Okay, let me just show now uh, what these things they look like. Here's a data set that Tanner collected um, where he took, I don't know, like 60 or 90 videos of himself, uh, dynamic fusion selfies, you might say. And he just went around with a camera and built 3D models of himself. Okay, and we can now use every single video to provide training data using the process that I just described, where we can, again, learn pixel-wise correspondences. Um, this goes with um, zero amount of manual data labeling. That's important. So the network is trained only on correspondences within any of these video sequences. Um, so Tenor at no point manually labeled, for example, that the shoulder in the first video corresponds to the shoulder in the second video. It turns out that even without that kind of information, the network learns an embedding that is consistent across videos. And I think that's a very important property. So here you can see, for example, uh, what these embeddings then look like um, for the different videos where the embeddings are color coded. They're projected down to a 3D embedding space, a color space. So what the network really learned is to, um, associate, for example, not a certain texture or color of the sweater or shirt that uh, Tanner is wearing, but it actually learned to correspond kind of left shoulder versus right shoulder or versus neck portion and things like that, okay? So um, once we learn these embeddings, and again, these are, these, these are dense embeddings for all the pixels, once we learn them, we can now go and solve a task that beforehand we would not have been able. So here's just another view on these embeddings that the system was able to learn. Okay, and you can see that they are actually pretty um, consistent, the color encoding, even though the lighting conditions and everything on the right is drastically different, right? So it's not only the clothing, it's really also the lighting conditions and of course deformations and things like that. Okay, we can now use this to transfer dynamic fusion models from one scene, so for example here, one model that he built mostly from the front of himself here. And let's assume we wanna match that into this scene. Doing this with standard features is actually a very, very difficult task, but we can do it with these learned embeddings um, reasonably easily. What we do is we take the embeddings on the points of the model that he built on the left, um, compute the feature embeddings um, for the image on the right, and then just do ransack on pairwise similarities between these features. And this way we can transfer the whole 3D dynamic fusion model from one scene to the next. So here's gonna be some examples of that process. So we can just take the dynamic fusion model on the left 
and snap it on the right using RANSAC based on feature similarities from the learned embeddings. And this is using color information for the feature embeddings only. Okay. Um, we also showed that this works in Kinect Fusion kind of scenes. This is a well known data set, MSR7 scenes data set. It's pretty small, but um, here it shows that we can very well localize individual camera views into the scene, again, using just these learned embeddings. Okay. Um, since then, Tenor also collected an additional data set. This is from a, a student lounge in the Allen Center, University of Washington. And uh, here he built 60 videos of that uh, gallery, very different lighting conditions. Uh, between videos also, of course, chairs and furniture moved around. And one half of the wall was a pure glass window. So very drastic lighting conditions between them. And what I just want to show here is, for example, that what you see on the left is a walk through the, the, bar, the, the map. Um, and on the right, you see it's an eight dimensional embedding space that he learned. So you show the first two show three dimensions each and then the remaining two dimensions are in the lower one. And what's important here is as he switches between different uh, scenes, the lighting conditions change drastically, but the embeddings on the right side are actually very nicely consistent. Again, without having trained that explicitly into the model. Okay, so these embeddings and uh, the learning process is actually uh, uh, very powerful. Another thing you can do now with this is, for example, what he did is he manually segment out certain objects from the scene. Okay, and then just takes another sequence of the scene and can match models from other scenes into this uh, mapping process. So what you see in the upper right is whenever something turns blue, that means that one of these objects that were modeled from other scenes can nicely be snapped into this one here now. And again, this works even despite uh, very, very strong changes in the lighting conditions. Okay, and you, you might have seen work like SLAM++. Um, I think the advantage of this approach over SLAM++ is that it actually does not, for the matching process, uh, SLAM++ was only um, working with um, depth information, but this really learns uh, to use color information as well, which can be good to disambiguate certain objects and things like that. Okay, with that I want to um, kind of finish this first part where again the idea is using good model-based mapping techniques in order to provide very fine-grained, very detailed supervision for learning highly robust features. Um, the next part is about um, how we can use um, enable a robot to autonomously collect data um, for object pose estimation. So we've done a lot of work on 60 object pose estimation where the idea is you have a 3D object model um, and you want to estimate the 60 pose of the object in a scene and that can be very useful for example for manipulation tasks um, if you have models of these objects. We've done work on segmentation, um, 60 pose regression, uh, deep IM is another line of work where we do an iterative matching procedure to um, to refine poses and that gives actually very accurate position estimates. And most recently we worked a technique called pose RBPF, um, which estimates full 60 distributions over the pose of an object. Uh, I just want to show you one video sequence here. This is for example a coffee mug as it's being tracked by this pose RBPF which uses particle filters to estimate the 3D XYZ pose and the 3D orientation on the object. So it's a full um, 60 post estimation framework. So now uh, we train these systems all purely in simulation. Okay, here you can see some example images that we use to train, for example, uh, recognition and embedding um, using some of these YCB objects. Okay, and the key trick of this whole domain randomization is always to generate various different lighting conditions, um, many different poses for these objects. But the advantage is, of course, you can generate that in simulation kind of very easily. The problem is, if um, you now want to apply that in the real world, there's often still some discrepancy that domain randomization is just not going to fix for you. For example, if you look at the other, uh, at the top one, this jello box is actually um, the, the texture on the object because they changed the, the object in between uh, is different. So these are both the jello box, but one is the real one and the other one is the one it's trained on. 
um, some objects, the configuration, for example, how the lid is on might change. And then if you look at the lower one here, for example, like the spam box, they have extreme reflections that, for example, in simulation, you might not have been aware of. So these kind of discrepancies um, cause a problem when you just want to now apply that in the real world. Here you can see a segmentation um, done by post, post CNN. Okay, of these objects where post CNN is purely trained in simulation. And you can see that it does a reasonably good job, like green is the cheese it box, um, yellow is the jello. No, yellow is actually the banana, I think, mostly. The spam should be this brown, and it's doing a pretty good job, and it's working reasonably well. But you can also see there's clearly still limitations. So the idea now is how can we enable a robot to go in its own environment and collect additional training data to refine those segmentation and pose estimation techniques um, um, so that they work very robustly in the environment in which the robot operates. Okay, so for that, um, this was a, a, an internship by Qing Deng, led by Yu Xiang and, and Arsalan and Clemens um, at NVIDIA, where the idea is the following. We put the robot, um, here's a Franca robot. Um, we're using here a head-mounted camera up there. Uh, we put objects that we want to estimate in front of the robot. Um, we train all the segmentation post-estimation uh, models uh, beforehand. And then we want the robot to autonomously generate data and label this data also autonomously so that we can refine the detection model. Okay. Um, here is one important part is as we put these, uh, these objects in front of the robot, it's pretty important that on the first frame we get a very good post initialization. So for that, we're using RGB and depth input. We then use post CNN to um, segment out the object as well as we can, feed this into this technique, the particle filter-based technique called post-RBPF. That then provides a full 60 post estimate for the object. Um, so far, that's all very much standard. Um, and we refine this through some iterative sampling technique. Details are not crucial here. Um, and then the important part is that we make sure that the estimate that we're getting for these objects is actually very accurate. So we're doing a post refinement step using ICP or SDF based matching, which is very similar to um, ICP. And then we make sure that that post estimate is actually very good. And in order to check that, we are comparing the depth that we're getting from the camera with the depth that we would get from the estimated object pose. Um, also combining that with the segmentation mask. And we're also comparing the image based um, color embedding with the embedding we would get from um, the, the, the 3D object model. And if the post evaluation realizes that this is a very good estimate for the objects, then actually we can use this as an initialization for the scene and the robot can actually move around with the camera in order to collect additional data um, annotated with the post estimates um, that we then can refine uh, using the motion of the robot. If it's wrong, then we just move the camera around and try to find a good initialization for these poses. But again, it's important that we make sure that the poses that we're generating are actually um, very accurate. Here's an example then what it looks like. Here's what the camera view looks like uh, onto that scene. And here on the right, you can see the objects reprojected into the image according to the object pose, to the estimation. So you can see that the estimation process on the right is actually very nicely consistent with the real image data. Here's another scene. And here's a more complex one. But um, again, all of this is done um, um, autonomously and the, the, um, importantly also um, just through this um, robust checking of the estimate that they are actually also accurate. Um, once we have that, we can use it to collect more data. So here's a robot. Um, here's looking at then at these scenes from these different viewpoints. We can also autonomously perturb the scene because we know where the object is. So the robot can pick up the banana and put it to a randomly chosen other location in this workspace. Um, we have different ways for changing the scene. So the robot can pick up objects, move them around. It can also sometimes just poke at an object. So for example, it might just push into the scene, now generate a new scenario, and then reinitialize the pose estimate. He is now, um, he did this for um, a good number of these scenes, as you can see the details in the upper right. 
and then we evaluated how well that works. Here's, for example, the post-CNN segmentation, where on the left you can see the previous without any real data, and on the right-hand side you can see um, the refined estimates that we're getting after uh, training on the real data that was autonomously generated. Okay, so far more robust than, than the purely SIM-based uh, training. We also have numbers. I don't think I have time to go into these, but even after only 20% of only using 20% of the data that we collected, actually we are getting really a, a very, very good boost in uh, performance of the 60 post estimation system as well. Okay, and this better post estimation also translates into better um, grasping. Here's some examples on the left where, for example, the pre retraining grasping failed because sometimes even a post estimate that's off by a centimeter or so might already cause failures, whereas on the right side, we're getting much higher um, robustness of that system, which is kind of based on single grasps. Okay. Here's another scene, uh, another example. Um, I don't think we need to go into this, but uh, the system then becomes far more robust actually after this uh, self-supervised retraining. So let me come um, to the end of my, my talk. So um, again, I think uh, in robotics using leveraging these model-based approaches, we can actually um, enable robots to generate their own data and highly accurately label this own data in an autonomous and an unsupervised way. So I showed this, for example, um, Kinect Fusion, Dynamic Fusion. You can also do this, of course, with a robot where we can train long range correspondences. And um, in addition to the examples I showed you on the mapping, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the work, really nice work coming out of Russ Tetrick's lab where they showed these uh, same kind of feature learning approaches, how they can um, help for uh, really, really cool uh, manipulation tasks. Um, um, we also can leverage simulation for pre-training and then bootstrap these kind of self-trained recognition systems that can then be refined in the real world. Um, of course, other exciting directions that I didn't want to have time to mention here are going into directions where the supervision doesn't always have to be that accurate, right? Where, for example, we just want to learn maybe predictive models purely from temporal data, which I think is a very interesting direction to go into. Um, and also, of course, this data that we collect in addition um, after simulation shouldn't only be used to refine our classifiers, but hopefully also we can use this data to feed it back into the simulation and thereby make the simulation more realistic so that it will also be more robust the next time uh, we run it. And with that, um, I'd like to thank, of course, the main people who were involved in this, in this case, the Kisuns were Tanner Schmidt and Shinke Den, uh, who was an intern at NVIDIA, and Tanner was a PhD student with me at the UW. Thank you very much. Thank you for that really exciting talk, Dieter. I'm sure our participants already have some questions, and uh, but we can go over them during the panel discussion um, sessions after uh, two talks. Next, we have um, Abhinav Gupta. Abhinav Gupta is an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University and research manager at Facebook AI Research. His research focuses on scaling up learning by building self-supervised lifelong and interactive learning systems. Um, specifically, he's interested in how self-supervised systems can effectively use data to learn visual representations, common sense, and representations for actions in robots. Um, with that, Abhinav, we're really excited to hear your um, talk right now. Thanks, Abhinav. Um, can you hear me? Yep. All right, perfect. Um, so before I start, I guess the first thing, uh, Dieter's last slide is my first slide. So um, I would like to thank all my collaborators and I'm basically channeling their thought here right now. And this has been the work of a lot of people I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, hopefully all of you know that in the last decade we have made significant advances in AI. But if you somehow think in all these approaches, whatever is working right now, the learning paradigm has, it has still remained quite narrow in scope. So the first place where we have made a huge impact is in computer vision, for example. And if you think of how computer vision algorithms work, you first download millions of images from the internet, 
you then label them and then you perform uh, basically supervised learning. Uh, it's supervised because you know the labels, you are trying your algorithm to predict those labels. And I also call it passive because the algorithm has no control over the data uh, in, in this scenario. The data was basically, these are million images that were downloaded uh, randomly by the, uh, randomly from the internet. Now the second place where we know uh, there has been a huge impact in this last 10 years is this uh, field of reinforcement learning. Uh, and, uh, and mostly in this case, you have a simulator where you hand define a re task reward, and then you perform your favorite reinforcement learning algorithm. Here in this case, you try millions of uh, episodes before you can actually learn anything meaningful, uh, essentially in this scenario. But in both these scenarios, I mean, these they do not look like exactly like how, how humans do learning in this in this in this case. For example, in humans, most of the learning is unsupervised or self-supervised in nature. We do not get so many labels of dogs, cats, and mushrooms, which is what ImageNet is made of, and we do not get environment rewards when we are make, doing bulk of our learning essentially. Second, in the case of humans, most of the learning is physical in nature. Third, in the case of humans, um, the data is not passive. So if you remember the first, uh, the, in computer vision, we are mostly using only passive data downloaded from the internet. On the other hand, in the case of humans, we are doing active exploration. The agents have their own ability to create their uh, data points as they move along, as they learn more and more essentially. Now, it, it is also critical to know even in RL, when, where you have active exploration, most of the exploration is done in cons in task. Uh, it's basically on policy, so it's task driven exploration essentially. But in case of humans, we do not even have that. We are basically learning to learn about the world in some sense essentially. And finally, in the case of humans, we have we do not learn one model for audio, one model for uh, vision, a third model for language, and so on. We basically are learning one common model. So we have a multimodal learning uh, that is going on. But forget all these reasons. There's one reason why the current paradigm of what is working is not going to work. Because both all these approaches, both in vision and uh, reinforcement learning, they're just not scalable. For example, in the when it comes to vi visual learning, even the ImageNet, which is one of the biggest data sets in vision, has 1 million bounding boxes labeled in five years. Whereas the amount of visual data that exists there is huge. For example, and this is a pretty old number, Facebook has more than 600 million images uploaded daily. In case of actions, uh, most of these approaches that, you are, that we have been seeing like uh, from different labs, we basically see all these approaches in simulation. And in simulation, for solving one task, it takes tens of millions of iteration. Now consider the ta uh, task of a baby. I mean, babies are doing thousands of tasks every day. So there's just no way this current paradigm can really scale up uh, if you see. So my research has been focusing on how we can build self-supervised curious robots, which will learn by experimenting in the real physical world. And the th three key terms here are self-supervised, curious, and uh, learn by exper like experimenting in real physical world. And so this is what the three things I will focus on in today's talk. But I know this is pretty, it's, this is not a good tagline. So, so my tag punchline is, I want to build robots that learn like babies. And I did put the term loosely here. I'm, it's loosely inspired. So because no one actually knows how babies learn. So I'm going to say loosely inspired from babies. Now, one key observation here, I think, which is critical is that there's no one com cell supervised algorithm. There's not like a one cell supervised algorithm that the baby uses or anyone uses for the whole life. If you think there are different stages of learning that happen in the case of in a cognitive development of a baby. So for example, at the stage one, most of the data is passive. Right? This is at the stage where the baby is lying down. It's not yet starting to interact with the physical world. And so at that point of time, the baby has no control over the data. It's basically getting lots of images and you can say videos of by looking around uh, essentially. And this is where a lot of bulk of the data lies down. Then the baby starts interacting. And so you get more action driven data, for example, then the baby starts interacting in a more intelligent manner. And that's where the active exploration happens. The baby comes up with this new experiments in mind, like what if it happens if I throw this block, what happens if I put this block in the mouth and so on. And so this is a stage of active exploration where the, Baby is creating some kind of experiments and, and trying to verify. And then the last two stages, which I'm not going to touch in this talk, but I've uh, been doing a lot of work, is the stage of imitation learning. Here, the 
data is lots of passive data, which is like you are observing your parents or other people doing actions. And from there, you try to imitate and uh, do exploration from there. And the social, where you are basically observing other babies, like in a daycare, you're trying to learn uh, from that setup, essentially. In this talk, I will basically try to uh, focus on the, the first three part stages, the passive learning, the physical part of the robot, where the uh, physical part of the learning, and then the most uh, bulk of the time, I'll focus on this uh, curiosity modules, basically how to go and actively look for your own data, uh, essentially. Okay, so let me start with this first stage, which is the passive learning stage. I do want to emphasize that this is the stage where a lot of data goes in uh, because every frame you are seeing in, in the real, in the world is basically a data point essentially. And in computer vision, we have made a lot of advances in self-supervised representation learning uh, recently. But if you look at most of these advances, the way these approaches are working is you take the current data sets, which have pixels and labels. So this is for example, ImageNet, you drop the labels and then you basically learn your model. And so most of the contrastive learning approaches or other uh, papers you are seeing, most of them have been focusing on uh, basically trying to use ImageNet itself and see how good it works on ImageNet by just dropping the label essentially. But I think what these approaches are missing is the core reason why we actually wanted to do self-supervised learning in a passive format. This is because we have lots and lots of data. And so in the first setup, we wanted to see how, what happens if you actually remove the data, uh, data labeling bo bottleneck and you basically study the cell supervision at scale. You go from 1 million to 10 million, 100 million examples and see how would current cell supervised approaches work uh, in, this, in this setup essentially. And one hypothesis is that maybe by just scaling up the data and even existing cell supervised approaches, you would get much more uh, benefit essentially. And so again, I mean, I'm, since this is a small talk, I'm going to basically mostly be giving up summaries of what we found out. So the first interesting observation that we found out when we tried to scale up to 100 million images is that the performance still improves log linearly with the uh, amount of training data. And so this is the similar kind of pattern you get in the supervised approaches and you're now getting that in uh, cell supervised approaches as well. So now, if you can basically are seeing performance improvements in non linear, you can basically continue to add more and more data and hopefully you'll continue to get uh, better and better representations out of it. So this is kind of very uh, interest, interesting and exciting. The other thing is most of the self supervised approaches try to create a pseudo task essentially. Um, and so the pseudo task could be contrastive or pseudo task could be like jigsaw solving and so on. And it turns out that as you make your pseudo task harder and harder, your representation learning improves better and better. So that is again a good sign in the sense that you can keep making your task pseudo task harder and then the representation that you will learn and end up learning is going to be much, much better essentially. And interestingly, it turns out that even using like the approaches that existed three or four years ago in sales supervised learning um, and just by scaling, you can actually do very competitive and even better than supervised approaches on standard vision tasks, for example, object detection, 3D scene understanding, and, in, and for the task of visual navigation, for example, you can do very good with self-supervised learning approaches. But in classification and low short learning, like low short classification, there's still a long way to go. Although some of these gaps have now been filled by recent contrastive CPC uh, style approaches, essentially. Okay, so that was basically um, describing how um, we have been doing in the passive form. But the next stage in the case of baby is when the baby starts interacting physically with the world. So this is the stage where you basically play with toys, you throw, put things in your mouth, you throw things, and you're trying to learn about the world by doing these actions. But before we even go in at this path, physicality is a big bottleneck if you think of itself, right? I mean, uh, physicality makes it hard to collect data uh, at large scale. And so that's what we wanted to first see, like what would happen can we actually scale up le uh, physical learning at that level itself? So this was the first experiment that we did in 2016, where we tried to scale up learning uh, to, uh, so we basically had the setup where the robot randomly picks a location on the table, tries to go and grasp that location. And it does that not one time, not two times, but uh, 50,000 times uh, essentially. So we ran the robot 16 hours a day for 700 hours, collecting these 50,000 examples the data automatically gets labeled here because uh, there is a force sensor in the wrist which will tell you whether you were successful or not successful in picking up the 
object. And with this large scale data, you can then use basically uh, high capacity models like deep learning and you basically get significant improvement in performance. We tried similar thing with drones. So we basically built a drone that would go and just randomly crash into objects. So this drone crashed 12,000 times into different object, uh, different in different scenes. And the idea is again to just basically do large scale physical learning essentially and see how would it work uh, in this scenario. And the algorithm is simple. Like when you're far away from the obstacle, you call it good data. When you're close to colliding, you call it bad. And then you just learn your end-to-end -end deep neural network for this task. And it turns out again, the idea that using lots of data, real world data and simple algorithms can actually give you significant, uh, significantly good uh, results in, for example, the task of navigation. So here's a drone in the Wien Hall of CMU. It sees, for example, it's going to collide, then it turns around and goes into the other part. Here is a much more narrow scene of a hallway with chairs. Again, the drone sees it's going to collide with the chair. It turns around and continues essentially. And so again, the idea here I'm, we are, I'm trying to show here is, is that physical learning with lots and lots of data is a plausibility and you do not have to be just in simulation, for example, to do something like this. Um, and following our work, there has been a lot of work in self-supervised robot learning from grasping like uh, Arm Farm at uh, Google to so several works at Berkeley and uh, Dieter also has uh, a lot of work as well in this area. But I, if you think, I mean, this, all the self-supervised learning in physical world still has a long, long way to go, uh, essentially. And I argue that one of the big bottlenecks in self-supervised learning in real physical setting is the diversity problem. Still, most of our learning basically looks like either in a lab or in a simulation. And this does not look at all, at all like a real world. And so in recent work, we have been trying to investigate how you can actually collect data inside the homes so that the data looks much more real world and is going to be much more useful. Of course, there's a problem with real world, right? We have a, are we even ready to take robots into homes? We have very expensive robots and robots which are probably not useful for anything uh, in the unstructured setup, for example. And so to tackle this, we have been trying to assemble our own low cost version of the arms, which can basically are very transportable and they can, they have mobile base and an arm. So you can really try to collect data at large scale inside the homes. But the second problem is this problem of not being useful. Like here we have a chicken and egg issue, right? I mean, because until the robot is useful, you cannot take it into homes, but until you have in real world data in, inside the homes, it cannot be useful essentially. To break this, we basically started renting uh, homes using Airbnb. So in Pittsburgh, for example, uh, Airbnb home just for $75 a night. And pre-COVID time, you could just basically rent a home for a night, take two or three robots out there, just borrow the objects from the home and start basically doing collecting data in, in that setup, essentially. And so we basically tried to scale up learning in 15 different Airbnb homes and see how would it perform. And because we used a cheap robot, we also have some noise in the robot. So we basically learn a separate neural network to predict noise uh, and then a separate network for grasping. And it turns out that if you actually start collecting data in home, you get a much more robust model that not only works good in the home setup, but also works good in the lab setup. And this also transfers across different hardware, for example, from Baxter. It, uh, we use the same data to train a model for Baxter and it worked reasonably well, essentially. Okay. so the exploration or whatever we were doing in this, the way we were collecting the data uh, up till now is still pretty random, right? We just choose a random point and we say, okay, let's go and try to grasp at this one. Or we choose a random direction and we say, let's go and try to hit that random uh, object essentially. But a critical ability in case of humans is this ability to create your own data point um, and like come up with the next thing, what you want to know about the world, you start and try to do things and so that you get more data about that uh, setup. So in the last part, I want to focus on how you can be, how you can learn in a physical world with, uh, with basically these kind of uh, active exploration stuff. And there has been some recent work, for example, in Curiosity mod, uh, uh, modules, for example. So this is the paper from Patek et al, where they use uh, a Curiosity module to learn uh, a Mario game. And again, it takes 10 to 100 million iterations to learn anything meaningful. Now think of, if it takes 100 million iterations to learn about Mario, which is so structured, and this is what a general room might look like, 
you can think how hard it is going to be to have any curiosity module to work in the, the real world essentially and the reason these approaches do not work is because most of these curiosity based algorithms are predictive models and you basically try to predict the future and then you see if the your if you are able to predict future properly or not and you reward the actions which lead to the areas where you cannot predict properly now because this is this reward is basically kind of uh, dependent on the environment uh, and we do not know environment function environment is a black box and that's why we have to use this reinforce operator which is basically going to train your policy essentially and so we wanted to explore can we get rid of this uh, black box optimization and can we actually learn or can we formulate curiosity more in the form such that the gradients can go back all the way and you do not have to use for example the reinforce operator at all and so our approach was kind of pretty simple instead of learning one future model we basically learn n different uh, future uh, like predictive models and the reward is basically like the disagreement between these n models so if the models disagree then you want to reward your uh, exploration policy because this looks like a area where you should explore more whereas if all the models agree that means you already know a lot about this part of the world and so you do not want to reward uh, the policy function here in this scenario essentially and with this simple approach you you can see now this because everything is uh, you know these functions they are differentiable so there is no dependence on any environment at all anymore and so with this thing since there is no dependency you can the gradients can travel all the way back and hopefully can lead to much more optimal learning essentially and so here is what a robot would do with a random exploration and you can see basically even after hundreds of iterations it's still not doing anything meaningful because there is no structure uh, in the gradients that go back on the other hand if you use uh, our algorithm uh, which is basically this uh, this exploration by disagreement uh, you, just after 1200 uh, samples the robot starts to already do something meaningful for example grasping objects pushing objects and so on and so with just 1200 examples you can see the robot starts to do much more structured and meaningful uh, experiments in the world but even this setup will be still hard to discover complicated behaviors for example behaviors like opening bottles or ball pick up or corkscrew or bar pick up and so on so we have been also explored uh, simple ideas like how you can try to reward things which would not be uh, explored if their two arms are not being used and so on and with such simple uh, extra curiosity reward like how can you better use your two arms uh, you can actually now discover some very meaningful behaviors like bar pick up with two things or picking up a ball by supporting from the other arm and this could be also transferred in the real world so here is an example of how the two arms can basically uh, pick up balls open bottles and the ar tags here are just used for evaluation purposes not being used in the uh, module uh, itself okay i think i am almost out of time um, yeah so the last one minute i'm going to just say that we have been also doing a lot of work on trying to use multiple sensory modalities for example audio uh, and vision together to explore because a lot of exploration in case of babies happen with the audio right i mean the toys create sounds and that's what guides the exploration and so we have tried to use this audio visual module for exploration for example in atari where uh, different actions will create different sounds in atari and that will help you to do better exploration in atari but even in the real world for example navigation uh, these kind of setup like uh, doing joint audio video visual exploration has been really really helpful in improving the performance of exploration a lot okay um with that i think i'll end the talk um again the summary is there is not one probably one self supervised algorithm that we should be using there are multiple stages and every stage is kind of very interesting and how things pass from one stage to another is going to be uh, even more fun I, which i have not even started uh, looking into yet thanks abinav for the very nice talk i'm looking forward for the panel discussion later um It is my pleasure to introduce our next guest, uh, Pierre Samanet. He's a research scientist at Google Brain, Brain, where he focuses on self-supervised learning for robotics. He started working on self-supervised long-range visual navigation with uh, deep conf nets with Jan Lecun in 2008 already, and since then has pioneered many contributions in deep learning architectures such as Overfeed, 
adopt on Google Lnet representation on self-supervised learning, such as time contrastive networks. And we are very excited to, um, to uh, learn more about his latest research. Hi, yeah. thank you. Thanks for the intro. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to present uh, approaches for scalable learning using play and language. And you can see on the left, uh, examples of um, us being able to train a, a single model uh, that can perform manipulation tasks from vision while taking in unstructured natural language as inputs. So you can see the blue um, line here is um, the current uh, tasks being given to robots and in gray is the next one that we type in. So this, uh, I'll be presenting work uh, of my colleagues at Google and X, uh, Corey Lynch, Rostan Dinyari, Mohi Kansari, Tess Chao, Vikash Kumar, Jonathan Thompson, Saga Levin, and myself. Okay, so our, so our goal is to train a generous robot that can do anything. And to achieve that, we want to find scalable methods for jointly learning control, vision, and language. And the policy on the right is a step in that direction since this was trained in a scalable manner and it was not trained with any predetermined task. So instead it was trained with play and that's, that's how it's prepared itself to perform any task in that scene. So how, how do we get here? Uh, in this talk, I'll present three papers from our, our group, uh, recent papers. Uh, the first one uh, explores, explores how to acquire control and vision in a scalable fashion. Um, the second one, learning to play, explores how to automate collection of play data. And lastly, we'll explore how to um, acquire natural language instruction following in a scalable manner as well. So this workshop is interested in the question of how to scale up uh, robot learning. And I'll try to answer that with some of the recipes we found. Uh, so first, what kind of data do we want to collect? Um, so we argue that play data is rich, diverse, and easy to collect. Um, and how do we collect natural language such that it's also scalable and matches the richness and diversity of our play data? So we'll be using hindsight instructions for that. Um, now, what modalities do we use? We, we go for actions, uh, vision, and language. And we show that um, when you self-supervise on, when you use uh, language self-supervision, uh, self pre-training, uh, it actually benefits the, the robotic manipulation. We get higher performance and generalization when you combine all these modalities. Um, wow. what, what type of supervisions should we use? So regarding exploration of the space, uh, we first use uh, human interoperation um, of play. And from that, we are able to learn uh, autonomous play. So it's self-supervised by the machine. And uh, the data, we can self-supervise the control uh, from this unlabeled robot experience using hindsight goal relabeling. That's, that's a key uh, insight here. And finally, we, we can also use supervised language and self-supervised language on top. So, so a bunch, uh, like Abina was saying, we use multiple uh, criteria here. And Another question that comes up is how much data should we use? So we show it's possible to use, to learn from lots of autonom autonomous play and human play because these are cheap. Um, but it's also okay to use the expensive language annotation uh, because we actually don't need that much. Okay, so what do we mean by play data? So we ask humans, so this is an example of uh, humans playing through uh, the VR teleop or even in, in real life, you can do telehealth as well. Um, so we ask humans to do anything they can think of in all possible ways uh, and with lots of repetitions. And you should know that this play is continuous so you can collect it for hours without interruption. And you, you can think of play as, a, as an exploration mechanism that prepares, um, this is why we don't, we don't need RL in this case. There's, there's no RL in this talk. Uh, because play is kind of uh, uh, taking this shortcut of giving you the expression. Um, so it's an expression mechanism that is going to prepare you for the real world by showing uh, a rich and diverse set of skills. 
um, that I'm always ready for anything in the future. Um, so, so Play provides this uh, broad set of skills and shows you diverse solutions for each skill. And it's easy to, to collect, so thus it's scalable. Uh, but it's also unbiased because there is no task definition or no labels to collect. So, so we don't need to segment um, anything. We don't need to reset. And this is really ideal for real-world collection. Um, and finally, we, we show that um, we get higher uh, task success when using play in, uh, rather than task demonstration for the same amount of data. OK, so here we, we argue that it's OK to use any type of supervision as long as the amount of uh, data you use is in proportion to the collection cost. So obviously, it's OK to use as much uh, autonomous play as you want because it's practically free to collect. Um, but it's also OK to use um, Lela. expensive Lela. labels as long as you, you oh, is someone asking something? No. Um, so it's OK to use expensive labels uh, in a small quantity with respect to the rest. And this is what we're going to do. So. Here we show the relative amount of data uh, we use for each type across uh, the papers. Um, so for example, this is to illustrate that we use very large amounts of uh, autonomous play and uh, natural language, which is uh, the cell supervision, because this is kind of free. And we use medium amounts of human play uh, because that's cheap. And we use very little uh, supervised language. Um, so it's okay to use any of these in these proportions. And it was actually very beneficial to use this human uh, supervision. Uh, and yet, we didn't need, need to use too much, so it's OK. All right, so how do we self-supervise uh, control from play? So the main idea is to pick a random window of play data. So this is one example. So it's a short sequence of two seconds. And we label the last frame of that window as a goal uh, in hindsight. So it's a hindsight goal. And because we um, want to train a general robot, we formulate the pro our problem as a goal condition policy that we want to learn. So it takes in the current uh, um, current state and uh, the goal and outputs the actions to go from uh, A to B. Um, so in theory, at test time, you can plug in any goal, and then uh, you should get the desired actions to reach that goal. Um, and we we train this, we train this with random windows of play, which cont contain the exact information uh, to go from this goal to uh, this point to the goal. Uh, and there's never a discrete label task label here. This is a fully continuous uh, task formation. Um, so we, with enough play data, you should see uh, you know all the possible points um, that you can think of, and uh, you can generalize uh, there. So you really get this continuous uh, continuum of skills. And um, we show that this generalize is better uh, and is more robust perturbation than if you train on discrete uh, tasks. Um, so this is um, this is how we we self supervise. But I, I don't have time to explain this. But it's basically uh, self supervise is in the middle and I'll put some actions. Um, and at this time we can just. Uh, uh, input uh, input a new goal image. So on the right, we have this goal image. Uh, we can feed that to the model, and it will just produce the next action to reach that goal. So we evaluate uh, that on these 18 tasks that we um, define by hand just for evaluation purpose. We never train on these labels. Uh, so we have close row, uh, push the button, uh, rotate the object, these kind of things. And we find that we get 85% accuracy when we use the, the play data uh, on this action task. And but if, if instead we train uh, this is ID five, if instead we train on the, the task demonstrations, actually the performance is much worse and it even degrades really rapidly when you perturb the starting position. Here, here is a rollout of the policies. On the left, you have the goal image you want to reach, and on the right is the rollout. Um, so we can actually, the single model, we can feed it multiple goals in a row. So on the left, you have this current goal image, uh, and that's pressing the button. And you can do, in this case, you can do eight, eight tasks in a row by just following this, uh, all these um, goal images. And again, this is a single model that can do all, the, all these things. 
And we find that the Tisney, um, this is the Tisney of our uh, latent uh, space. Um, so even though the, the, the model was never trying with any labels, uh, the semantic of the, the skills emerged naturally, they clustered together. So we colored the, the, the pro, uh, these are plan, uh, latent plant uh, points and we color them by semantics and we find that the, all the drawer sequences are together, for example. Um, but this visualization is just for seeing that this uh, functional, this the semantics emerges naturally. We don't actually use this for training. Um, okay, so as we mentioned before, uh, autonomous generation of play is another way to scale up uh, because it's it's free data. And by autonomous autonomous play, what we mean is an agent that can be left alone and play by itself and generate new interesting data. So you can see one example of human play here. Um, and obviously this is a very advanced case. Uh, this agent is able to gather a lot of data about objects without any supervision. And in this paper, we try to do something a bit similar by learning to imitate human play. So this is what you see on the right. Um, so this agent here is just exploring, is just playing around without any particular goal. Um, and we can see that it's left uh, by itself and plays and uh, discovers new uh, interesting, I mean, does it does functionally interesting behavior. So it's not as advanced as the one on the left, but it can, uh, it, it's enough to improve the results. So the way uh, this works is, uh, let's see. Yeah, so we take random, uh, we take this human play data set of 32 minutes and we take random um, episode of, of unlabeled play and we learn a general mapping between the state and a distribution over likely actions um, that will come next when a human is playing. And once we've learned this distribution of action, uh, we can just unroll the policy and that's what we've done here for 10 hours. And um, given that data, we can actually, yeah, sorry. First, if you just train the, the on this data, human play, you get 65% on our 18 tasks uh, benchmark. Now, if you retrain that and add the autonomous play, you get a 10% 10, 10 boost. So this is the, the main result here. And we have um, quantitative evidence here that the, the, the the autonomous play explores new states that have not seen, seen, been seen before during the human play. And on the right, uh, we show what happens if you just use random expression. So the performance actually drops uh, drastically the more data you use, whereas when you use the autonomous play, it actually keeps increasing. And here are some uh, more examples of um, autonomous play. So you can see it does sensible functional stuff. Okay, um, so finally, we, we're going to see how uh, to ground language in play. So first, why do we care about natural language? Uh, it's obviously a very flexible and universal way of specifying a task. It's a much more practical real world uh, than providing a task ID or a goal image, for example. And we'll also show that um, we can get higher manipulation accuracy when we also self-supervise on larger maps of language data. So, Remember that we found this way to learn uh, really general um, skills on top of play data in a scalable fashion. So we want to retain these properties of uh, scalability to our approach, but we also want to um, make sure our language uh, can cover the same broad, the same breadth of uh, the continuum of skills here. So how can can we do that? Um, so. Our approach is to use something uh, called hindsight instructions. Um, so we take, basically we take random windows of play, uh, one to two seconds, and we ask human readers to um, answer the question, how do you go from start to finish, looking at this one video, and then they type in a sentence. So on the right, you can see what they came up with in blue. Uh, so for each video, they, they wrote these sentences. Um, Yeah, and uh, let's see. Yeah, so 
we ended up collecting uh, a very little amount of uh, language here. It's less than 1% of the, all the possible windows of our play data. So uh, it's a small percentage, but it probably covers the, the whole space pretty well. Okay, so now, okay, so now that we've paired um, sentences with random windows of play, how can we train both? We have these two data sets. One is image, one is language. How can we train them both? Uh, so for that, we're going to introduce uh, something called multi-context imitation. Um, and um, so, so what we do here is we, uh, no, it's one second. Yeah, so um, we learn a common uh, latent goal across multiple types of data sets. So this is our latent goal. Um, and for each type of data set, we are gonna have an encoder that goes into that shared space. We have an image encoder, we have task ID encoder and the natural language encoder. And this allows us to train varied sources of, uh, um, of, uh, of play. And at test time, we can actually um, only we can choose to only use the language encoder, and this means that you just need to type in a sentence, and then it's gonna um, learn to do the action. But most of the learning still happens thanks to the the goal images. Okay, so so in our experiments, we show that training on play uh, gives us a huge boost of about twenty percent. This is the gap here. Um, so here for the same amount of data, if you use play or you use demonstration on, of tasks, a specific task, then you lose a lot of uh, robustness and accuracy. And the se second big result is that when you train on uh, language, um, if you use a pre-trained so, uh, pre language embedding, uh, it gives you a 10% boost in accuracy. So we, we are able to some transfer of knowledge uh, from language to uh, actual manipulation. Uh, here's an example of what happens if you train on specific demonstrations instead of place. On the right, you have this model that's been trained only on these 18 tasks, and but it's not able to transition between tasks because it's, it's, the distribution is seen is too narrow. Whereas on the left, uh, this model has been trained on play and uh, the distribution is seen is so wide that it actually can tr transition between the, the tasks. And we also show that an example of, uh, of our model uh, taking 15 different instructions in a row and being able to perform all of these in the sequence in a, using a single model. So pull the drawer, drag the block, close the drawer, push the door, press screen, etc. Now, the, the great thing about controlling a robot with natural language is that it allows for new modes of interactive uh, behavior at test time. So, we can have humans uh, collaborate and help the robots um, when it's uh, stuck with something. So here we show an example. Actually, let me come back. Okay, so I have to wait a bit. But here the, the, the robot is trying to push the, the red button initially. Um, and um, let's wait a bit more actually. So it's taking its time to press the right button. Okay, so initially we're asking to uh, move the door to the right and then press the button. But the problem is the door is not fully open, so it gets stuck against it. And then the operator can say move back to get unstuck. And then by accident, it opens the drawer. So then the operator says, okay, close the drawer and then move the door right, which it doesn't initially, it moves to the left. But eventually, it moves the door the way to the right and is able to press the right button. So this is just showing a cool example of collaboration with humans. And we also show that you can perform tasks that uh, are difficult in one go. So putting the object in the trash in one sentence is hard. But the operator was able to break it down into first pick up the object and then drop it. Um, and this is another example of uh, human robots collaboration here. And these tasks are not tasks we ever thought of initially. And same as move back, we never really thought about this and it just worked out of the box. Uh, we show that we, if you pretend on different languages, we can also uh, input um, commands in many different languages uh, that, and that comes for free. And um, I just want to say that we have this, op this 
environment is open source uh, right now. It's just the assets, but we have some uh, play data coming. And I'll just wrap up now with uh, this a summary. So we, we've uh, used a bunch of little, uh, you know, scalable recipes. So hindsight relabeling is pretty important. Uh, relabeling of, of code images, uh, hindsight instructions. So this is a key on how we were able to really learn from this big uh, uh, play data sets. And we self supervise on human play, we learn to generate more play, we self supervise on language, and only use a small amount of language supervision. And using the recipes, we're, we're able to learn vision control language in a single model. Um, we could control robots with natural language. We um, acquired skills and language in a scalable fashion without defining tasks in advance. And um, we got higher uh, task success when using play instead of demonstrations. And we were able to show transfer uh, knowledge from language to robots and also higher task success using a language bridge mining. And I want to thank my collaborators here uh, from Google. All right, thank you. Yes. Oh, okay, welcome, go ahead. Okay, yes, thank you also from my side. Uh, Fantastic talks, uh, wonderful. I'm Wolfram, wearing my T-shirt from RSS 2012 in Sydney, and, um, and excited to see you all here. Would be great if all the panelists could come online again. Like I see Pierre and Abinav, and uh, Dieter is missing, but I guess he will be with us in, in a few seconds. So this was exciting. From... Um, hi, Dieter. Nice to see you. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes uh, for a little bit of a discussion. Um, I would actually start with a with a question from one of the panelists, um, basically from a, from the audience who asks, "Can you think of any task or field for which self supervised learning is not useful?" So this is a general hammer that fits everything. I mean, self supervised learning is is great, especially for let's say maybe building up fundamental capabilities, right? Especially when the robot is doing its own thing. I can imagine, I don't know, when you want to, for example, interact with people or so, um, maybe you want to do this actually with the person around in a self-supervised way. Of course, you could then phrase it also as a self-supervised learning task, like predict learning predictive models for what the person is doing, right? Which can be done in a self-supervised way. Um, I can imagine maybe where you need labels, where some external entities need to come in to provide you some labels, which come through language. So there was actually a question I had um, on on the from Pierre on the you said you did the language came through self supervision. How, how how did you do this, or what was the thought behind that? Uh, which part? On, on one of the earlier parts, there was something with the language stuff coming through self-supervision. Oh, yeah. yeah, I didn't have time to dive into details, but we uh, use uh, models that have been pre-trained on uh, huge amounts of just text. Uh, mm -hmm. So just pure NLP pre-training. Oh, the pre-training, okay, got it. When you use that, it works better after. Yeah, yeah. I think the... Um, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think the, my, my answer would be that, uh, I think what Dieter said, right? I mean, that self-supervised learning is basically used for representation learning or learning models about the world. If your task does not involve either, like, I mean, then probably you can get lots of, like, so for example, if you are doing something which is not from the general thing, I mean, so I think that's where you would find self-supervised learning to be, like, you can get lots of easy task data and so on. But generally, it is a fundamental thing. That's what we all of us are arguing here for that self-supervised learning is a fundamental block which is going to be useful in intelligence essentially um so yeah i think that would be my answer i i have a question like despite these uh, really convincing re results how far are we away away from real industrial application of that technology Okay, I mean, I can I, say something. I, I'm not, I, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, someone else. Yeah, <laughs> and I was just going to say that in computer vision, I feel like self supervised learning is already starting to be very uh, beneficial. Like, I think, especially the recent papers have almost shown that they can beat uh, 
like things on detection and so on. Um, in robotics, I would say we are still uh, not. I mean, I maybe there are some things which are which are cool, but at least in my knowledge, we are still little far. So I mean, I I would say, and I, it it would be bad to predict timings from here on because. you know when i the, uh, always the best example i give is when i was doing my phd i would never have thought that we would be at this stage in at this point in my career so i think timing predictions are always you're going to be proven wrong anyhow so uh yeah that's because you haven't been in robotics long enough i would never have thought we still that we still haven't solved it but okay <laughs> <laughs> i but always one note with respect to with the industrial manipulation right i think there's two aspects that are somewhat slightly different from the settings we the all three of us actually discussed is on the one hand side industrial application you often need really high precision for many of these tasks which is slightly different from what we are doing even though we we do some things that require some sort of accuracy but at the same time industrial settings are often more constrained than what we've been looking at so which is a plus right so my feeling is actually um self supervised learning especially for this pre training right can be really good and um because you don't want to have a robot like spending a week in the factory first to try to figure out how to pick up a certain object right so for pre training it can be good and then maybe self supervision for this lifelong training so that if your manipulator um has to interact with a new object then maybe overnight it can do some additional training on that so i think there's there's um a lot of promise in that area too there is another question um from the audience What would you say are the biggest promises as well as biggest challenges for self supervised learning for robotics apart from the stuff that you are doing I think it's representation learning as also I've been upset right where um uh, if you look at um also related to PS node learning embeddings like le it's all about learning strong representations that you can extract from raw visual data for example or from raw data and for that self supervised learning i think has at least shown to be extremely powerful in the language domain more and more also in the vision domain and i think it's starting now as we've seen in in rob robotics so i think for embedding representation learning is um has huge potential There's one question to to Abinav um for that learning for babies. I once like ages ago I also read something that um learning takes place incrementally and you so so there is a specific program that you go through in your development right you you yeah, so step by step kind of like first the numbers and the, then the logarithm so the, how do we embed this into uh into like robot learning and experimentation So, I mean I think I mean I actually completely agree that learning happen it's a curriculum that we follow and interestingly in case of babies the curriculum actually and the milestones remain very similar even though they might be culturally being brought up completely different part of the world for example and that is so amazing I feel but in the case of babies that happens mostly because of hardware restrictions right I mean the baby, the body go, grows bigger 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 so the reach becomes larger then you start walking so your navigation starts there and so on I I think for robotics if we can somehow so I think there's a big question and I I don't know the answer to it frankly like is this curriculum on purpose or is this something which is going to be useful because it's making you know initially you are just in a very small reach of the world your world is very small slowly and slowly the world starts getting bigger and bigger essentially so is there something meaningful in that curriculum or is it just you know a quirk of our human bodies that happens because of that No, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, frankly. I'm just, <laughs> uh, but I think if we can somehow include uh, these kind of curriculum in self supervised learning, I think that would be fun. And there are a lot of interesting things to happen. So, for example, how does all that passive learning that happens transfers to active uh, exploration is, I think, the most critical thing. Um, like whatever you are seeing, your parents and everyone else do around you, how will that guide your exploration in the future? I think those are very interesting questions but yeah I mean I think so there's so, one but there's one question directly to Pierre uh, which is uh, uh, can you include constraints on the manifold of learned latent plans to make sure that robots will not be damaged during execution um yes i mean we haven't really 
looked into this, um, but this this definitely. Um, I mean, we we're also looking in in, uh, in doing planning in that space and trying uh, potentially avoiding the areas necessarily shaping the the main space to have to avoid the bad areas, but just maybe plan around that. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how because uh, you do want to maybe experience the bad, uh, but hitting yourself where what it means. You do need to see examples. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how how we can do that in the real world um, to shape that embedding. Um, yeah, so I think there are ways to do it, but we haven't really looked too much into it. Then uh, Juan Camilo Gamboa Higuera has a question: How hard would it be? to learn modular and composable skills using the language-based self-supervised play techniques. Do you think this use of language would subsume hierarchical learning models? Yeah, that's a good question. You, you could, uh, there's a question of where, where do you start stop learning skills in the hierarchy? Because uh, if you can do everything in the, every sentence that is given to you perfectly, then maybe after that, it's just about language and uh, composing these things together. Um, so there's definitely a more abstract, as you go higher, the more abstract uh, composition and it's not clear um, when you should stop. Maybe you could even just do scripting. Um, so it's a, maybe it's a matter of, just a matter of how much micromanagement you want the human, the user wants to do. But you could totally uh, do a bunch of things by scripting uh, one sentence at a time. So and maybe I overall, there's not even. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Just Go ahead. Chime in. But maybe overall, there's not even this strong hierarchy that we often have in our as roboticists in our head, right? Where we have the low level controller and then we have a discrete level that reasons about all of that. I mean, one thing we learned from language processing over the last years is that even words, right? You represent them in a, in a high dimensional continuous embedding space in that. Um, is extremely well suited for even very complex parsing problems and everything. Maybe there's something even robotics where maybe we should even shoot for these hierarchies, right? But on the other hand, of course, and there was in another workshop also Leslie mentioned that this morning, of course, compositionality is, is a really nice feature, right? If we can maintain that, but maybe we don't have to go through discrete things to do that. I do have one uh, discussion point that uh, I realized by listening to your talk. So you all live in these, this post probabilistic world right now. And, uh, and so in, in like this probabilistic world, you can reason about uncertainty and basically ask yourself like, what is the most informative action right now? And I somehow have the impression that often actions are generated just randomly. And I, I just wonder as to whether this is, uh, actually an efficient strategy or what do you think about that? I actually think a lot of work or if someone else wants to go first. I'm... I mean, you can also how it works in your case, but yeah. Yeah, no, not, not only my, but in general, I think there's a lot of work even on the DeepRL side, right? Like with this curiosity learn, Abhinav is also involved in, the, in this direction where, for example, uncertainty of predictive models learned in the DeepRL settings are being used to explore new states and to explore new actions, right? In our context, for example, where we, when we collect this uh, precisely labeled additional data to refine the simulation trained models, we also use these notions of uncertainty to make sure that actually we do have pretty good estimates, right? But that is often, I see in many of these visual detection techniques, um, these uncertainty measures are not as robust as we would like them to be. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but I don't think uncertainty totally goes away, especially if you wanna, if you think about long-term tasks and things like that. Yeah, and actually you get, when you train a softmax classifier, even though you train one class at a time, you get this really nice uh, smooth uncertainty across uh, similar cl uh, classes like dogs and cats, for example. So I do think there's a lot of, uh, uh, certainty data that emerges naturally there. So uh, where will we be in a couple of years? What are the next big things?
one little step after the other. <laughs> I think I, I, I like think the idea. Of, uh, uh, I like the idea of not no, kind of stepping away from defining tasks. I mean, that's what I'm advocating for. Just don't define anything in advance. Just let the data uh, define the task and let language define what the task means. Mm -hmm. That's that's the direction I, I hope that we can go in. Yeah, I mean, what I really like is the the the, the path towards multimodality, right? Uh, including sound, maybe more um, haptics, pressure, and then even language. And uh, you know, and uh, I really like this idea of uh, being in a conversation, like generating meaningful text, and uh, because that also means that you understand or that you have the representation of what is going on. Right? Is this yeah. a way to go? I mean. Robots are, have, are going to have to explain themselves, I think. So they will have to generate text. I'm going to be biased in my answer on this one. Um, but um, I think in the next two or three years, I think the most exciting part is going to be till now. I mean, like vision part of cell supervised and the robotics part of cell supervised is, I would say, still pretty not married in some sense. I mean, and so if for me, the most exciting part in the next three years would be is if we can use all that data on you. I mean, I'm saying YouTube, but some kind of video data that exists out there, egocentric data or something to guide whatever we have to do in robotics or something. I think that there's like so much amazing amount of data lying there of interaction with objects and doing all these kind of things, just never been used in like even real world manipulation or robotics and so on. So I think that for me is the most, and that's where I would want to spend my energy on, see how all that data on this egocentric or first person or a YouTube data could be useful in the robotic task essentially. Like, can we bring them to the world of robots in some sense? Not just do classification. We have been doing the classification and all that stuff from them for a long time. But I think if we can do some robotics with it, I think that would be so much amazing. Yeah. I, I, it would be I agree. super powerful. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, but, but just um, my feeling is at least at this point that the visual recognition isn't strong enough to provide you the kind of supervision that I think we need for it to be really useful for robotics. And there seem to be two levels, right? There's the, let's say, the lower level control side on robots, how to do things. And then there's a higher level side and the YouTube style stuff can really help on the higher level side. I think um, we also still need to figure out how to do those lower level things so that we can bridge the gap between, let's say, YouTube video understanding and so that the robot actually learns something from that. Once we have that low level actually in place, I think then this could be super powerful. I think it's great to have uh, YouTube style data, like uh, Epic Kitchen is really cool, I think. But uh, often I would rather myself, I would rather go for less data with more modalities. If I have control, I, I think it's, you, you just learn much, this learning signal is so much richer that uh, this is more like a computer vision uh, dream to just uh, learn everything from YouTube, but I don't think it applies as well to robotics. Yeah. Okay, I do have one and final question. Dieter, go ahead, then one final no, question. No, no, go. Yeah, so there's one uh, from uh, Thomas Malizievich. Uh, question for Abhinav, how does, that, does the idea of uh, accordances fit into robotics research on self-supervised learning? Is accordances or affordances, I don't know. I, I think affordances, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so I think, I mean, that's what I was basically trying to hint at is I think pretty exciting. I think for me, the fun part is, right? I mean, so I do work on stoves every morning and somehow my 16 month old now knows how to go to that stove and try to do stirring inside pots essentially. And so he did not do any RL. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he basically used all the data he has been seeing me do every day, every morning. And somehow the first action he went was go inside the pot, take a spoon and start stirring around. I mean, I mean his, his stirring is pretty bad, but whatever. I mean, so I think that's what my feeling is like, use all the passive data that is out there to learn what kind of exploration you want to do with the, what kind of objects. And of course, then at that point of time, there's some kind of trial and error that happens from here on in. And I think that for, for me is the way it fits in. Like the passive data, the video data is going to do some model learning of what different affordances of different objects are and how, and from there on you basically, you start using your own actions to go and explore the world.
uh, in that manner. Uh, so it's kind of passively guided exploration. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, unfortunately, the time is over. It's running faster in these uh, decentralized settings somehow. Um, it was an exciting discussion. We are now going for a break and uh, I lost my plan. So Oyea needs to step in and announce when we are going to continue. See you then. And thank you again, all speakers. I'm going to go give a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, where are you? Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot for for the uh, super interesting uh, panel discussion. We will now take uh, five minutes uh, short uh, coffee sure. break, and um, afterwards uh, we will continue with uh, Roberto Calandra, Chelsea Finn, uh, Peter Abil, and Andy Zeng. And then um, oh no, no no sorry sorry I missed. Um, afterwards we have the contributed talks exactly. And then we go to the, we go the set of speakers. So five minutes uh, break, and then uh, the contribu uh, four contributed uh, papers, and afterwards we continue with the invited talks. So see you in five minutes. Oh, <laughs>
Okay, um, we're back from short break. Um, we would like to continue with the first uh, contributed paper discussion. And um, how this works is that um, we would like that, that for each of these uh, four papers, the authors um, in shortly introduce again their paper uh, for one minute. And afterwards, uh, we will have a discussion for um, 15 minutes. So, um, Hugo, are, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Okay, so we study perception in the scenario of an embodied... Yeah, you have to tur turn yeah. your mic on, Hugo. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, now I hear you, go ahead. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so let's uh, start with the description of the paper. So we study perception in the scenario of an embodied agent equipped with first-person sensors and a continuous motor space with multiple degrees of freedom. We consider theoretically the commutation properties of action sequences with respect to sensory information perceived by such agent. From the theoretical derivation, we introduce the sensory commutativity probability criterion, which measures how much an agent's degrees of freedom affect the environment in embodied scenarios. So roughly, the idea is to, for each degree of freedom of the robot, play the same action sequence in two different orders from the same starting point and checking if the result in the uh, if they result in the same observation or not. Uh, in the paper, we show how to compute this criterion in two environments, including a realistic robotic setup, and we empirically illustrate how it can be used to improve sample efficiency in reinforcement learning. Thanks. Okay. Th uh, thanks a lot, Hugo. Um, uh, for the next paper, uh, Son, uh, are you there? Um, hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so for for our paper, so uh, uh, our paper shows how to train a state encoder that uh, encode scene images into a discrete uh, representation. Um, using the usual log likelihood objective, we propose to train this encoder using an uh, an additional visual question answering task. Uh, to improve its uh, reasoning ability. Um, to evaluate uh, the effectiveness, uh, we also describe a full planning framework with a uh, stochastic action model. And using our uh, training pipeline, we uh, obtain a latent representation that, uh, which is, from which it is easier to learn a tracing rule. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Song. Um, for the next paper, uh, Travis. Uh, yeah, so I'm Travis, a PhD student at McGill University in Canada. And so in this work, we're um, basically interested in learning uh, robust no navigation policies for uh, robots operating in the natural real world environments, um, like in the forest and underwater in the, o in the ocean. And this could be for things like doing uh, environmental uh, sampling. And so specifically, we're building a, um, a low level uh, controller that is um, sample efficient for learning uh, a navigation policy. Um, so for, for an off-road vehicle, we use the IMU to basically measure roughness to uh, teach the robot where it can go. And then we take this data and train a goal condition policy so that we can uh, navigate to specific points uh, in the world while still inheriting some of the low level behaviors um, from the previous policy. And so we show this for uh, an off-road vehicle, but we also used um, an underwater vehicle. We also demonstrated in an, on an underwater vehicle, um, the goal condition policy to be able to uh, avoid obstacles and then um, um, still swim over desirable things like, like coral reefs while um, still reaching a, a specific point in the world. Awesome, thanks a lot. Um, Neha, are you there for the last paper? Um, hi, so Kristen is going to introduce the paper, Kristen. Hi, um, I'm Kristen Morris. I work um, at Facebook AI Research with Neha. I'm a researcher and she's an AI resident. Um, we are presenting our paper on learning state-dependent losses for inverse dynamics learning. 
in which we hypothesize that meta-learning a loss function whose parameters depend on the current robot configuration outperforms standard MSC losses or other meta-learned losses when adapting a learned model for inverse dynamics to a novel scenario. We test our hypothesis on a KUKA arm performing five motions of a pick and place task. Um, and we see that the performance of our inverse dynamics model uh, is able to adapt from being trained on a sign motion task to a pick and place task, um, which consists of moving the arm in five motions. Um, yeah, we see that using structured loss, especially our state dependent loss, uh, outperforms all of our other losses. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, now we would have time for um, some discussion. Um, you can ask uh, questions about the other papers if you want. Um, we ha we also have some questions for the audience from the audience. So for example. Um, so for example for the second paper um we have we have a question from from the audience so for for a song um basically they ask um about the the video um they say uh regarding the results for the reasoning uh where can the superior ability to represent spatial relations with the KLD loss be seen in the reconstructed images? Um, sorry, um, can I hear the question again? Yeah, um, so they, they, they mentioned uh, about like uh, three, uh, in your video, where can the superior ability to represent spatial relations with the KLD loss be seen in the reconstructed images? So something about like a minute four in, in your video. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure I understand. Um, so was it about the result? Um, the QA accuracy result? Hi everyone, uh, Joschka here. Maybe I can elaborate a little bit on this question. So this question uh, was to a comment of yours uh, in the video where you showed the reconstructions and then you, your comment was that um, even though the reconstructions may not be as clear as the ones um, with the other loss, uh, it would be clear to see the superior ability to represent spatial relations with this um, VQVAE approach using this uh, KLD loss. But it was actually, so I was wondering like, how, how is it actually, how can we see this from the images you presented? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so usually we use the reconstructed uh, arrow to, uh, to, to learn to how to reconstruct the, the images, right? So, but uh, in this, uh, but in our paper, we uh, uh, use the KLD loss, so, in this way, we want to uh, um, to learn to reconstruct uh, according to uh, to feedback from an uh, expert network. So this this network is uh, uh, is an expert expert to uh, uh, in at um, uh, answering question according uh, um, spatial reasoning question, and um, uh, using the feedback from this network, we can um, learn to reconstruct only the necessary uh, details in the scene image uh, that is uh, important to answer the question. Uh, so we can uh, ignore the details, uh, the, the unnecessary details like the background or the shadows, uh, and we focus on only the important details according to this uh, expert network. Uh, hello, I am Oz, uh, supervisor of Sun. Uh, I can add also to this question. So basically, this superiority also can be seen in the uh, question answering accuracy when we train only using the KLD loss. So that shows that using this relational network also enforces 
uh, that the latent representations encode these spatial relations, which are then reflected on question answering accuracy. Uh, so I hope that also answers. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, then we have a, a question also to the uh, self-supervised goal condition policies for navigation unstructured environments. There was a question, um, so for the um, underwater experiments, I think the, the policy that you presented there was initially learned by imitation learning. Can you maybe um, elaborate a little bit which approach you used there? And you know, was this more towards supervised behavior cloning? Was there some inverse RL uh, approach maybe involved? Or, and is this important for your approach also? Yeah, so for in, in that work, we did use um, imitation learning. Um, and basically what we did was we uh, deployed the robot, um, you know, the very first version, we just manually moved the robot around and put it into different uh, situations that it might encounter. And then we labeled the low level actions. And so it's just kind of a, a ResNet 18 um, um, network trying to predict uh, low level uh, control actions. I think, uh, you know, towards the future, we want to be able to generalize better and, you know, collect a lot more um, data. And so we need some mechanism for self-supervised um, um, learning. And we have some work on um, not so much the collision avoidance because we don't have a lot of uh, sensors that can act as a, as a, as a supervisor, but for, for doing things like uh, coral reef uh, monitoring and stuff, we do have um, basically a, <clears throat> a coral detection um, network. We want to be able to like, if you want to measure, you know, the, how, how alive the coral is, because a lot of the coral is dead, um, you know, we, we do have a supervisory signal. So we do want to kind of move towards that where we can, we can put it in the water and basically have it learn some of these new different areas um, on its own. But it, yeah, an example shown in, in the work, the initial policy was trained with, with behavioral cloning. Great, thank you. Um, then there's one more question is also for, uh, for Song. Um, that one concerns the size of the, di the uh, dictionary um, in the latent space that you learn by this uh, VQ VAE approach. Does that have to be um, determined beforehand? And is it task specific? And if so, how do, do you best set this size of this dictionary? Um, okay, so um, the dictionary size, uh, mm, I think was, uh, uh, ha yeah, have, have to be defined beforehand. And, uh, and um, mm, it's not uh, so in our experiment. We just use uh, the uh, default uh, size by the uh, orders of the VQ VAE VA, uh, order uh, paper. So we did not choose any specific dictionary size for our experiment. So it's somewhat robust also to that setting. Doesn't need to be mm -hmm. specific. No, yep, yep, it doesn't need to be specific. Great, thank you. Um, so for, for, the, uh, for the Neha's, Neha's paper and Chris, Kristen's paper, um, there was also a question, um, so um, how much do you think could be gained by uh, using an adaptive optimizer that allows for individual learning rates per dimension? So, um, yeah, we actually uh, have some results on an adaptive optimizer um, with the MSE loss. Uh, we compare it to our learned loss. Um, I can share my screen to show it to you guys. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, uh, I wonder if you can see it. Um, so we compare uh, our learned loss, which is st state dependent um, with um, losses that are um, uh, an MSE loss that is that uses an adaptive optimizer. Um, let me see if I can zoom in. And we show that our state dependent loss, which is right here 
for some reason I cannot move my screen anymore. But if you can see it, uh, our state dependent loss is still like flat across the X axis and the adaptive losses, which are in pink and um, in uh, orange colors, um, optimized with Adam are still uh, more unstable when we are uh, doing the online adaptation experiment. So we did perform that experiment and we see, still see improvement in our state dependent losses there. Okay, great, thanks a lot. Um, I think we have to uh, continue with, with the invited uh, talks from the speakers. Maybe if you could stop sharing the screen. Yeah. yeah. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Roberto Calandra. He's a research, research scientist at Facebook AI Research, where he focuses on robot learning. Um, after completing a PhD from Technische Universität Darmstadt in Germany under the supervision of Jan Peters, spent two years as a postdoc at the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence Research Laboratory working with Sergi Levine. Uh, Roberto is best known for his many contributions to deep reinforcement learning, uh, model-based RL, tactile sensing, dynamics modeling, and Bayesian optimization. And uh, with this, uh, stage is yours, Roberto. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be here and thanks for uh, organizing this very interesting workshop. Um, so the talk that I'm going to give today, I think it's a little bit uh, different from the talks that we had so far um, because it's going to focus um, a little bit less on, um, uh, you know, on paper that I published and I want to present. And instead I'm gonna try to, to summarize and share with you uh, a little bit more some, some high level thoughts and a few lessons that we learned by uh, using self-supervised learning in the real world on real robots. And I hope that some of these thoughts might be uh, you know, provocative or, or interesting and useful. Um, so in, in this spirit, I'm going to start by asking, um, what is self-supervised learning? Um, which is of course a very tricky question to you know, to answer, and there are many answers uh, probably for different people. Um, to me, what supervised learning is, is essentially supervised learning just without the pain of manually labeling uh, data. And this is a very important um, distinction because in, in robotics, we all know how, how difficult it is to collect data, how difficult it is to label data, and we all know how uh, you know, the experimental setting is really, uh, can, can be very daunting. And in particular, I'd like to point out a very uh, thin difference between two particular cases of self-supervised learning. Um, the first case, uh, which is fairly common, um, is the case where we want to learn matching embedding. This is, this was, for example, most of the work that, uh, that Dieter presented before. And uh, some of the classical cases are, for example, automorphism, where you want to learn a forward dynamics model uh, of, uh, of, of your system, of your robot. However, there is also a second uh, particular case, which I, I personally think it is actually, from a theoretical point of view, uh, more interesting, but I will not treat, uh, treat this much into this talk today. And this is the case where we uh, instead have automatic labeling systems, uh, which provide data for us. Uh, and, and this labeling system can be, uh, for example, weekly, uh, uh, sort of weak, weak classifiers. And there are a lot of interesting relationships to semi-supervised learning there. But again, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to talk about this much into, into this talk. So um, if we want to look at self-supervised learning, I feel that it's important also to, to think and, and explicitly say uh, what are the benefits and most importantly, what are the limitations uh, of these techniques. And uh, this is not a comprehensive list, but uh, you know, the first things that comes to mind is, is of course that uh, we can collect a large data, uh, large corpus of data set. And, and this is feasible because we don't need you know, we don't need to pay somebody to, to, to manually label the data. We don't need to have a PhD student there labeling the data overnight. And, you know, I did this uh, myself a, long, uh, a lot of times. 
And, and this is very valuable because as essentially allow us to, to super scale, um, uh, you know, our, our learning algorithms as Abhinav mentioned uh, before. Um, a second important part, which I feel it's a little bit underestimated, um, is the fact that in the real world, using a self-supervised learning also constrain us and force us uh, to, to think more carefully about what is the experimental design that we care about, uh, how we design the experiment themselves, and also to have better engineering uh, to support uh, a more uh, rigid and accurate uh, experimental design setting. And uh, um, this is uh, sort of uh, an interesting case because uh, we, we all know Oops, sorry. Uh, we've all seen, you know, in many of our uh, experiments uh, in, in robotics traditionally that, you know, our papers look very, very nice and, and very, you know, uh, amazing, beautiful, but in practice, the data collection uh, was always uh, very painful. There were a lot of hidden things that uh, it's, you know, we are hiding under the rug and, and somehow having this sub-supervised um, data collection process I feel help to avoid this sort of um, discrepancy between what is visible from the paper and what is actually the data, how the data are collected and so on. And um, another important aspect um, is that uh, as, as also Abhinav have mentioned, it seems very obvious that as a, as a humans, we do use self-supervised learning extensively. I have a three years old kid and you know, he learned so many things without me or my wife ever explaining to him uh, how to grasp an object. And that's, I think, a very uh, strong hint that this is a valuable approach and we should investigate it extensively. Uh, finally, uh, of course, um, I'm a scientist, I'm a little bit lazy, so it's always nice to see uh, the robots work on their own while you, know, uh, you can rest or, or think uh, without having to, to label that. Um, on the other side, there are also two limitations, which I think are very important to, to express. And the first limitation, uh, which applies uh, also in, in the case of, of embeddings, is the fact that we are assuming that we know the structure of the problem, and we know that this uh, structure uh, is consistent. Um, it might sound like something that is uh, not so important, but in practice, we are using our, a lot of human knowledge of the problem in order to be able to do this. And uh, some of the work that I think would be interesting, you know, uh, in the future would be to try to automatically extract this structure, uh, if possible at all, maybe using causal, um, causal uh, theory. Uh, the second problem, which only applies instead in the case of, uh, of labels, is that if we are automatically generating labels, we also need to uh, design these labeling mechanisms. And one example that I can give was that a couple of years ago, we had a paper where we were learning how to grasp objects. Uh, and effectively, we had to design uh, a classifier that would tell us after we would lift an object, uh, whether the object was still in the hand of the robot or not uh, at the end of the, of the grasp. And in practice, these weak classifiers are, are much easier to classify, to you know, design, manually design, than the whole problem that you're trying to solve. But still, in some cases, it might require uh, some, some level of, of expert knowledge. So in the, in the rest of the talk, um, I will quickly go through three different points. One point is that I want to share a few lessons that we learned uh, from applying self-supervised learning on real robots. The second point is that um, I will uh, use as an excuse a recent paper that we published to show and to motivate some of these points that I'm going to discuss. And the third point, which I will really, really briefly hit on, is uh, what it means, uh, COVID, for self-supervised learning and how we can um, ironically benef benefit from this situation. So, uh, starting from uh, our recent paper, uh, at ICRA we presented a uh, new tactile visual, uh, vision-based tactile sensors uh, called DIGIT, uh, which essentially um, is the first tactile sensor with, with a very uh, compact uh, form factor, uh, which can be mounted on multi-finger uh, robotic hands, while at the same time being highly reliable, which means that we can now collect 
hundreds of hours of interaction with the world. And as a third point, being uh, very easy to manufacture. And uh, um, Digit is designed to be a, a modular high quality sensor, uh, which can essentially just plug in uh, via USB uh, port. And at the same time, it can be uh, either um, injection molded or 3D printed at home. And uh, uh, compared to previous design, effectively Digit uh, allow uh, a very nice platform for, um, for, for doing experiments uh, about tactile sensing on real robots. So um, the kind of images that you would get from, from a, uh, this kind of sensor is something that look like this, uh, where you can see uh, structures down to sub-millimeter resolution, uh, down to 15 microns approximately. Um, and you can get a fairly nice uh, and, and accurate see about the geometry of what you're touching. Um, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of great. Um, just to give a very brief comparison uh, against some tactile sensor that you might be able to buy uh, out there nowadays, uh, Biotech is probably the, the most advanced tactile sensors that you can, you know, money can buy. And uh, both of them can be mounted on multi-finger hands, like the Allegro hand from Wonic. Um, however, while the Biotech has 29 uh, contact points, uh, Digit has over 300,000 pixels uh, that returns from every measurements. And in addition, uh, biotechs cost about 10K to buy, while Digit uh, can, uh, can essentially be assembled in your, uh, in your maker space for about 15 bucks. Um, finally, but not the least, um, Digit is actually open source. We went through a lot of process to, to make the, the assembly process easy. And, uh, and everything uh, necessary to, to build one is available on the online at digit.ml. So if you're interested, please go out, check out, and we are very welcome to, to answer questions. So now, once we had this sensor, we were very interested in, in looking at some manipulation task uh, so that we could essentially test it. And of course, we wanted to use machine learning and in particular, self-supervised learning. And the task that we ended up uh, tackling or, or trying to tackle uh, was a marble manipulation. So um, imagine that you have a marble between two fingers. We would like to, to move the marble to a um, specified position uh, inside our finger. And this is actually a very, a very fine manipulation task, uh, which most robots would, would very strongly suffer to do this. And the way that we approached this, uh, this control task was by essentially using raw uh, images from the sensor uh, as input and, uh, and then controlling eight degrees of freedom uh, of the two fingers that were touching the object. And um, we started by collecting in a self-supervised manner, uh, a large data set of about 5,000 uh, uh, trajectory of the, uh, of the marble being manipulated when applying random actions. And uh, unfortunately, this is a low quality video, uh, which we did before COVID, which unfortunately prevented us to take more uh, high quality videos. Uh, but you can see that the, the classical uh, the trajectory that you would record would just be the finger moving the marble a little bit, and eventually the marble would fall down just because of the uh, random Brownian motion. And um, once we had this data set, uh, we effectively uh, use a model-based reinforcement learning approach where we first train a, a encoder-decoder structure with an information bottleneck, uh, which effectively reduced the problem uh, to a space where we are looking at the x, y position of the marble and the amount of force being applied uh, to the marble with respect to the finger. And once we learn this space, then we could learn a traditional dynamics model that take this X, Y, Z as part of the state, it concatenates with action, and is going to predict our next state. And uh, together with our model predictive control approach, where we would uh, sample trajectories into the future and, and, and apply the best one, uh, we were able to fairly successfully uh, control the, the position of the marble. Uh, so on, on average, we would uh, go very, very close to the final position, uh, to the desired position. Uh, although we had about 25% uh, failure case where we would just drop the marble uh, halfway through. And this is probably because of a, of a number of 
uh, of sort of um, choices like uh, having a fairly limited data set and, and using an MPC that was actually running in real time, which was more important for us than um, try to have something uh, more accurate. And if we look at some of the trajectory in tactile space, uh, we can see that uh, the goal, which is the red dot, uh, is initially uh, a little bit far away from the, from the current position, which is the, the green dot. But over time, the, um, the marble get manipulated fairly accurately uh, to, the, to the desired goal. Now, um, from, from, this, uh, from this set of experiments and from previous set of experiments on, on the grasping paper and others, we, we essentially collected six lessons which are, we think are worth sharing uh, about how to do self-supervised learning in the real world. Um, the first lesson is safety, safety, safety. Um, you absolutely don't want to leave your robot running 24-7 without being 100% sure that the robot is not going to hurt uh, people around, the environment around, or just destroy itself. And for this reason, um, it's effectively very important that you know, the first time you run it, you have people um, available there to make sure that nothing weird is happening. Uh, but also, you might want to um, have more safety constraint and safety guarantees than you would otherwise uh, require from, from an in-person experiment where people are available there. The second lesson was that um, careful experiment design is, is very important. And there is this uh, quote which I like, measure twice, quite cut once. And the idea is that uh, you do want to think very carefully what is the experiment you want to have and how you're going to run, uh, you know, what controller you're gonna run, how you're going to collect data, what is the whole pipeline. However, in practice, this is not always going to be sufficient. Uh, and very often we had the issue that, uh, although we carefully thought about this or we thought we did, uh, effectively it ended up being an iterative uh, process where we would try something and we figured out, okay, this is not going to work, we need to change it. And one example was that our initial data collection with the marble was actually using a, a, a marble um, toy, which would automatically reset uh, the marble up, up. And it, initially, it seemed like a good idea, but it turned out that there was too much variance over the position of the ball. And we would lose quite a lot of balls just because of the random variance of this device. And uh, replacing it instead with a, with a mechanical with a mechanical piston and, and, a, and a more appropriate shape uh, significantly improved our uh, data collection uh, speed. Um, a third lesson is that you should not underestimate engineering. Uh, engineering is going to be very painful, it's going to be very time consuming, and you should carefully plan for that for how much you can. The fact that you, know, you will probably spend more weeks than you want by setting up uh, a, a data collection process which is uh, good. And you should think about this. A fourth lesson um, is that designing and monitoring diagnostics are, are crucial. Um, and this is particularly important if you, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and you want to check your robot, you should be able to essentially look if everything is going to right. You might want to collect statistics and, and check if the data that you're collected also reflect what you expect to be collecting. Uh, you know, maybe you have 100% failure uh, of, uh, of your system and you know, that's, that's not what you were expecting. So you should try to include uh, and, uh, as many uh, diagnostic as early as possible so that you can correct uh, issues that there are with the setup in a, in a timely fashion. Um, ideally before you spend a week or a month collecting data. Um, a fifth lesson, uh, which is very important, is that you should log everything and you should ensure data consistency. Collecting data has a very limited cost. Collecting gigabytes of data, terabytes of data, has a very limited cost compared to having to repeat the whole uh, experimental uh, data collection just because you forgot to log something that turns out it's important. So just log everything and then make sure that you are actually versioning the logs, uh, which version of the logs you're saving, what version of the experiment you're saving and so on. 
And one tool that we found out to be extremely useful for us is this project called Hydra, which allowed to uh, essentially do configuration and automatic configuration of experiment. And that then turned out to be uh, very valuable for us. Um, the final lesson that we learned um, is that you don't want to code experiments as a sequence of action. This is something that uh, in presence of people you might want to do, but you don't really want to do it uh, automatically. And instead, uh, using finite state machine uh, actually proved to be much more robust uh, in, in, into the real world. Um, I just, uh, I'm running out of time, but I want to give a shout out about COVID. Um, I think that COVID is really forcing us, at least in my personal case, to rethink the way that we perform experiments. And this is mostly because, you know, we cannot get access, unlimited access to lab and robots. And I think that this creates an interesting opportunity to, to try to adopt self-supervised learning in robotics more widely. And this allows us to, to build and refine processes to, to have in place reliable self-supervised learning uh, processes and also you know, to stay home and, and safe uh, for, for people. And the question that I want to, you to think is, you know, um, what do we need to be able to run a robot entirely remotely? Is this even possible? I think this is an interesting question that uh, we will need to answer uh, sort of uh, in the next uh, years and, and months. Um, the, the paper with Digit was possible because of an exceptional number of people that participated in this project in particular, Mike and, and Poway. And to summarize uh, sort of the message today, I do believe that self-supervised learning is a very powerful and useful uh, framework for robotics. And uh, uh, although it has some, some limits, is something that uh, effectively works very well uh, if you can afford the engineering costs. And we briefly presented a self-supervised marble manipulation task and discussed some uh, ideas about lessons learned and COVID. And finally, I would like to point out that what I think is really important for the future is actually multimodal learning, which is a very natural and promising direction for self-supervised learning, where you can have many sensor modalities. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you very much, Roberto, for this uh, great talk and for your insights. Thanks a lot. So as before, um, we'll directly move on to the next invited talk, and then we'll have some time uh, for questions um, after that in the panel discussion. OK. And uh, next, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Chelsea Finn, our next speaker. Chelsea Finn is an assistant professor in computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford University. And she's also a research scientist at uh, Google Brain. Her research explores how learning algorithms can enable machines to acquire general notions of intelligence, allowing them to autonomously learn a variety of complex sensory motor skills in also in real world settings. Uh, in her time during her PhD at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, she worked with Sergey Levin and Peter Beal, and she pioneered many works in meta learning, reinforcement learning, end to end learning of physiomotor skills, and uh, leveraging visual, visual foresight for robot planning and, and control. And we're very excited to hear about uh, your latest work. So please, Chelsea. Thank you for the introduction. So today I'll be talking about data scalability for robot learning. And in particular, I think that the notion of data scalability might be the most important in terms of uh, developing algorithms that generalize broadly. Uh, and I think that self-supervision is a really critical part of this. So, in my lab, uh, as was mentioned, we're interested in, can we develop broadly intelligent behavior through learning and interaction? And our work has studied uh, different contexts, um, robots in, in a variety of different contexts, such as end-to-end -end learning of, of skills, such as the ones shown here, learning skills by watching a human doing a task, and so forth. And I think that one of the kind of critical challenges when we're thinking about this question is specifically with regard to generalization. If we want general purpose robots, they must be able to generalize across tasks, across objects, and across environments. And that's exactly what I'd like to talk about today. I'd like to talk about generalization, because I think that that's really a key bottleneck in actually putting these algorithms out in the real world. For example, the robot here that learned how to use a spatula to lift an object into a bowl wasn't able to generalize to new spatulas or to new objects because it was trained end-to-end -end in that one very narrow environment. 
So how do we think about getting generalization? Well, I think that in robotics, we often find ourselves in a situation like this, where the training data distribution looks a lot narrower than the test distribution that we would like to be able to generalize to. For example, the training distribution may be the lab environment, and the desired test distribution may be the real world that has a much greater variety in spatulas and environments and so forth. So how do we go about bridging this gap? Well, one natural uh, approach or one natural thought about trying to bridge this is to try to improve our algorithms, so that our algorithms generalize more broadly, um, for example, by building a structure or, or something else. Um, however, when I think about when we think about this question, I think that we should maybe take a, a page or a lesson from some other fields in machine learning. And in particular, if we want our robots to be able to generalize broadly, we should think about training them on equally broad data. Essentially trying to broaden this train distribution instead of taking our algorithms and trying to get our algorithms to generalize more broadly. And the corollaries to this is that we should develop algorithms that can learn from scalable data sources uh, because if they can learn from scalable data sources, they'll be able to train on much broader data and then we'll be able to generalize much more broadly. So how do we go about doing this? Um, well, to think about this, I think we should kind of reflect on what the data looks like in our robot learning experiments. And if you look at uh, the data that we trained our systems on over the past several years, uh, if we look at some uh, maybe three to four years ago, uh, our data looks something like this, like I should mentioned before, where there's a single object, a single task, and the robot was in a single environment. Uh, now, a year or two later, we saw work from, from CMU, from Google, from Berkeley, where we were actually starting to generalize a little bit more, where we collected data with many different objects so that we could generalize to new objects, but still a single task like grasping or placing, and the robot was in a single environment. Uh, and then more recently, we've seen uh, work here two examples from, uh, from Berkeley and Stanford, where we are training with many different objects and also with many different tasks. Uh, but still, the robot was in a single environment, which was the lab environment at that particular institution. Now, if we contrast this with uh, the, the kind of data that we see in, in machine learning, uh, what does that look like? So in machine learning, we have data that looks like this. And of course, this was about uh, 10 or more years ago. Uh, and this data has many objects, many tasks, many environments, uh, many different viewpoints, lighting, and so forth. And as a result, we've seen uh, kind of time and time again in machine learning that we can get broad generalization by nature of training on these broad training distributions. Uh, for example, you can kind of deploy an image classifier or a speech recognition system into actually real world contexts, and these systems can perform decently well, at least better than my robot can perform. Okay, so I think kind of the lesson that we've seen is that data scalability will have a much more substantial effect on generalization than algorithm changes. So how do we actually leverage this lesson in robotics? I think this is a really hard problem, uh, but I think that there are kind of a, a, maybe a general recipe we could follow, which is that first trying to leverage large and diverse data sets, and then also building algorithms that can learn from those data sets. I'm thinking if we can figure out how to collect and leverage large data sets and build algorithms that can learn from them, self-supervised learning algorithms essentially, uh, then we'll be able to make a lot of progress on generalization. Uh, and today I'm actually going to focus primarily on how, leveraging large and diverse data sets. I'll talk about some work on, where we tried to leverage data sets across multiple institutions, uh, as well as some work that's trying to leverage data from videos of humans. Uh, but my lab has also been recently working on uh, algorithms that can learn from such scalable data sources, including batch offline reinforcement learning data sets that don't have to collect data in the loop of reinforcement learning and can instead just take a batch of data and learn policies, learn behaviors from that data, as well as work in offline meta reinforcement learning where we assume we have a batch of multitask data and want to be able to use that to quickly adapt to new tasks without any in the loop data collection again. But for the sake of this talk, I'd like to kind of focus on the first part. And then at the end, I'll also briefly touch on um, some algorithmic components as well. So how do we leverage large and diverse data sets in the context of robotics? So if we take a look at kind of, um, take a machine learning point of view in terms of comparing the data sets we use in robotics to the data sets that we use in machine learning, what we might say about the robotics data sets is that they have extremely limited diversity. They're a single viewpoint, a single environment, 
the robot was only collecting data in the one lab environment. But the challenge that comes in is that in, from the robotics point of view, we don't want to have to collect all of ImageNet, all, all of all the data that machine learning algorithms train on, on our own robots. And the reason why this is kind of a very natural viewpoint is that the kind of current paradigm in robot learning is to set up an experiment, collect data, and then run learning on that data. And then rinse and repeat whenever you want to have your robot learn a new task or learn something new. You then set up your experiment again, collect more collect data from scratch, and then run learning. And this is an issue because this means that every time we want to run an experiment, if we want to generalize to the degree of image net, we need to collect image net every single time we wanted to run that experiment, uh, which is obviously something that isn't going to work um, unless you have like infinite resources, which in which case maybe maybe that would work. Okay, um, so instead what I'd like to think about is if we can accumulate and reuse broad data sets across labs, essentially share data and build algorithms that can learn from those shared data sets. And this means that we actually need to have, actually have to collect data, collect data and share data across multiple robot platforms because different labs have different robot platforms. But maybe this isn't all that revolutionary if you think about how in computer vision and natural language, people are constantly sharing data and constantly collecting data in different contexts and different environments. Okay, so how might we accumulate and reuse data across labs? Uh, to do this, we need to think about the problem of multi-robot learning. And the first step to do this is to collect a data set. Uh, and this is exactly what we did. This is work uh, led by Sudeep and, and Frederick. Uh, we collected data that looks a little bit like this, where uh, there's multiple robots um, interacting with in an environment. There are actually multiple different environments as well. Uh, this included seven different robot platforms, including a Sawyer, Franca, Baxter, KUKA, Widow X, uh, Google Robot, and so forth. Uh, it was collected at four different institutions at UC Berkeley, Stanford, Google, and UPenn. Uh, the data set has 15 million video frames total, uh, and it's collected autonomously by the robot, so it was actually fairly reasonable to collect all of this data, although we wouldn't want to have to repeatedly collect this data many, many times. Uh, and there's also 113 camera viewpoints in the data set as well. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, the data set is open for contributions so that we can continue to add to the data set and increase the quality of the interactions and increase the diversity of the data that we see. Okay, so this is our first step at collecting a data set. We call this data set RoboNet, um, somewhat inspired perhaps shamelessly from the ImageNet data set. And now the second step is actually to evaluate if it's useful. If sharing data across robots actually is helpful for learning skills and for generalizing to new situations. So what we did is we used the visual foresight algorithm, which is, is quite simple. Uh, we collect data, which was kind of the step that I mentioned previously. You then learn a predictive model that predicts future images as a function of the current image and the robot's actions. Here are example predictions that you can get from these kinds of video prediction models. And then once you have that model, you plan to accomplish different goals using that model, optimizing over a sequence of actions that will try to achieve a certain outcome. Um, so we, we kind of applied this approach to the RoboNet data set. This is kind of known as visual model predictive control, is another name for it, or visual MPC. Um, and we took the RoboNet data set, we held out one robot from the data set, and then we fine tuned on that robot with only a small amount of data from that robot. Uh, and this wasn't just fine tuning to a new robot, it was also fine tuning to a new environment with new objects and a new camera viewpoint. So we're really essentially almost fine tuning to a new experimental setup. Uh, and then we evaluated the model that was fine tuned on this new robot on a set of tasks on that robot. Uh, and we did this across, we, we did this, this kind of holdout procedure and fine tuning procedure three different times for three different robots. What we found is on the KUKA robot, when pre-training on RoboNet and then fine-tuning on the KUKA, you're able to do significantly better than if you were to train from scratch on the KUKA. And we're also able to do slightly better than uh, training from scratch on a larger data set on 1800 trajectories rather than 400 trajectories. On the Franca robot, we saw a similar trend where we were also able to do better on than a random initialization, both on the same amount of data, as well as on a larger amount of data, 8,000 trajectories versus 400. Uh, and lastly, we also saw a similar trend on the Baxter robot where pre-training with RoboNet was more effective than a random initialization. Although we also found that pre-training just on the Sawyer data 
was more effective, um, and, and then fine tuning on the back, so it was more effective than pre training on all of Robinet, uh, which suggested that some, some underfitting was happening, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later in the talk. Um, so while, of course, these success rates are overall relatively low, um, I think that kind of the important signal here is the comparison to random initializations. And it shows that we're able to actually start considering and, and generalizing to new robots, new environments, new objects, and new viewpoints, and really take a tiny, tiny step towards more generalizable skills and more real world environments. Okay. Um, so that's that work was looking at how we can use data from many different robots. Can we use other data too? So another very widely available source of data is videos of humans that are widely available on the internet, on YouTube. Uh, for example, here are, are a couple of videos on the internet of people doing very sophisticated skills. And perhaps robots can also learn from this kind of data source as well. Um, so this is really a broad and top source of data and includes very sophisticated interactions and compared to the very random interaction data that we collected in the RoboNet days that which is very scalable to collect, um, but doesn't contain as, as interesting and sophisticated interactions as in videos of humans. Now the challenges here is, is, is twofold. There's a very large domain shift between the kinds of videos that we see of humans and the robots environment. Also the morphology of the human is different and the human's arm looks different than the robot's arm. Um, we also can't access the actions taken by the human. So we can't like directly apply the enforcement learning algorithms to this data, for example. Um, so we want to take a first step towards thinking about this. And we considered, uh, we collected a data set of robot, of humans doing things in the robot's own environment. In this case, using tools in the robot's environment. And this is a, a first step because the domain shift isn't quite as substantial as videos uh, kind of unconstrained videos on the, on the internet, but there is still domain shifts caused by the, the human arm. And you also still can't access the actions that were taken by the human. And even if you could, they wouldn't necessarily correspond to the actions that the robot would take. It's also worth mentioning that this kind of data is also a lot easier to collect than guiding a robot arm through some motions or teleoperating the robot to do something. We're much quicker and faster and nimble when we're doing things with our own hands. Um, so, we took a, uh, to, to approach this problem, we considered a setting where we had both the observational data that I showed on the previous slide, as well as some random interaction data. In the observation data, we just had the, the sequences of images, whereas in the interaction data, we had both images and the actions that the robot took. And our goal was to see is, was if we could learn to do the more sophisticated tasks that require using objects as tools, using this mix of data, even though the robot had never interacted with tools itself. So what we did is we took this data, we formed a predictive model, uh, just like the video prediction model that I mentioned before, and then planned a sequence of actions using this data. Now, the key challenge here is learning this predictive model because some of the data doesn't have actions and there's also a dimension. Um, so what we did is we formed a graphical model to describe this problem. And we considered a semi-observed action variable denoted as A here. Uh, semi-observed in the sense that it's observed for the interaction data, but not for the observation data. And then we also uh, use domain variable D that indicates whether or not the video came from the robot or whether it came from the human. And this allowed us to model the domain shift between the two uh, kinds of videos. Uh, and then we can essentially augment uh, a video prediction model with these latent variables uh, and formulate what, what looks a bit like a conditional variational autoencoder and then optimize the evidence lower bound of that objective, which corresponds to a video prediction model, but with a bit of uh, latent variable inference to figure out what the actions are for the human data, and also uh, uh, do inferences over the um, over this kind of latent variable Z. Okay, um, so kind of the key questions that we wanted to study here is when we took this mix of human data and robot data, first can the model leverage observational data in order to improve? Um, we compared to SAVP, which is a standard video prediction model, but only trained with random interaction, as well as an oracle that received, was trained with random interaction, as well as kinesthetic robot demonstrations using the tools. And what we found is that we were able to significantly outperform over SAVP in terms of quantitative video prediction metrics. Um, of course, these aren't very interpretable, so we also looked at whether the observational data actually improves task performance. 
And here are some qualitative examples of different things that different tasks that we gave to the robot. In uh, this case, the goal is indicated by these arrows in the bottom left, where the robot figures out that it can pick up the pencil bag and use that to push the objects over to the side. Um, the robot can also figure out to lift this, uh, to pick up the spatula and to use it to push the, the pair onto the plate. Um, and likewise, it can figure out how to push this cutter towards the, the dustbin. Um, and quanti quantitatively, we also see an improvement as well. Okay. Um, Great, so I talked about some two initial works for really trying to bring in large and diverse data into robot learning, um, robot learning algorithms and robot learning frameworks. Now I'd like to talk a bit about a couple of the challenges. Um, and in particular, I'd like to talk about what is the, really the biggest bottleneck for handling these kinds of large and diverse data sets. Uh, and we took a lot of inspiration from this paper right here, which showed that with basically larger video prediction models, you can get significantly better predictions. The only thing they did was just to make the model bigger uh, and they got significantly better results. So we tried taking the video prediction models that we had and making them bigger by adding many more parameters. And what we found is that um, even when scaling up our models from uh, only a few million parameters to 500 million parameters, we were able to get significantly better uh, results, but still, um, we still see kind of underfitting and room for improvement. Um, so for example, in the 75 million parameter model, which is actually already bigger than our typical models, we see some blurry R predictions, and these become much sharper in the much larger model. Um, we also see no object motion prediction in the, in the smaller model here. And this is improved in the much larger model, but still has also a lot more room for improvement in terms of reaching the, the quality of something that looks more like the ground feed. Um, so essentially we're seeing this bottleneck of underfitting, which is not something that you normally think about or hear about in the context of deep learning. Uh, and so I'll briefly touch on one work that we've been trying, one, one way that we've been trying to think about this problem of underfitting. Uh, and essentially the, the problem of underfitting comes from the fact that we're trying to model everything about the world from this data. And we wanted to ask the question, can we essentially train a model to only model what matters for certain tasks? And if you can do this, then maybe we can address the underfitting problem. Uh, so for example, consider this image, say you want the robot to do something with the saw, that means that it doesn't need to actually predict many of the other objects if it only needs to do something with the saw. And so what we'd like is first a scalable self-supervised approach that can learn these kinds of models without requiring supervision from a human. And we would like these uh, kind of the model's predictions to be task oriented. I want the representations and the predictions of the model to be kind of oriented towards the things that matter for a task. Uh, and these two things may seem at odds because something that's task oriented may inherently require some semantic supervision that comes from um, a human, for example. Um, but uh, we kind of designed a framework to try to actually achieve both of these two des desiderata. Uh, the idea is to represent tasks as goal images. This allows us to actually specify a task without requiring human supervision. Then we pass goal images into the model. And finally, we aim to kind of train the model so that it focuses towards goal relevant content, which you can do uh, by looking at the goals that are passed into the model. Now this last and third point is the most challenging part. How do we focus the model towards goal relevant content? Uh, to do this, we thought about the theoretical question of how do model errors on different trajectories affect, affect planning performance for certain goals? Uh, this, is, this is actually a question that we can get some leverage on. So say we have the example that I mentioned before where you want to do something with the saw and consider these two trajectories. It turns out that, uh, and as this may be pretty intuitive, is that it's actually okay to predict the yellow trajectory very poorly as long as the orange trajectory is predicted very well if your goal is to do something with the saw. And it turns out that we can actually formalize this intuition uh, and kind of the key insight of this work is that the worst trajectory the worse the trajectory is for the goal, the greater prediction error we can afford on that trajectory. Uh, and we can actually, we actually show kind of a formal proof for this in the paper. Uh, and what this means is that it is actually possible to redistribute model capacity by actually uh, changing how the model's errors are distributed and having lower error on good trajectories for good trajectories for a goal and higher error otherwise. 
Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll uh, kind of maybe go through this pretty quickly. We kind of tried a very initial approach for redistributing model errors where we condition our, our dynamics model on the goal, you relabel trajectories uh, to actually acquire goal reaching trajectories and reconstruct a goal residual to encourage it to be more goal centric. And we find that we're able to redistribute errors to be more accurate on goal relevant states, as well as get higher task performance um, on a variety of tabletop manipulation tasks by nature of this uh, redistribution of our model's errors. Okay, um, so in terms of takeaways, uh, kind of the main message that I'd like to kind of convey is that if you want your agent to generalize broadly, you should train it on equally broad data. I talked about how we can acquire equally broad data by sharing data across institutions, by leveraging expansive data sources such as videos of humans. Uh, and also I talked a little bit about some of the tensions between underfitting and scalability in terms of self-supervision. Okay, I'd like to thank my students uh, and looking forward to taking some questions during the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. This was a fantastic presentation. Thank you. And uh, it's a great workshop. I really like all the uh, presentations today. And uh, <clears throat> the next one is um, going to be given by Peter Beal, um, one of uh, the most outstanding um, robot learning researchers in the world. Um, he's from University of California in Berkeley. He is known for his work on imitation learning, reinforcement learning, and meta learning. Um, he graduated from Stanford, and uh, during his PhD, he did also some very, very interesting work on uh, autonomous helicopter flying. He, uh, his original plan was uh, to become a professional basketball player, which fortunately didn't come true. Um, he has done amazing robot stuff on uh, not tying assembly, organizing laundry, famous video, lo locomotion, and vision-based robot uh, uh, manipulation. Peter, go ahead, please. Thank you, Wolfram. Can you hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Great. And as Wolfram said, a lot, a lot of the work's been done in robot learning. A lot has been done actually by Chelsea <laughs> over the past few years, and I was lucky to be involved in that. And what I want to share today is actually something uh, very specific we've been working on for the last six months. Let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. this off your screen. So the last six months, uh, we've been asking ourselves a question a lot. When we look at deep reinforcement learning, and clearly we want to learn from pixels. And clearly, at least when we started on this uh, project, there was a big gap between learning from pixels and learning from state. And does there really have to be that gap? Or should we be able to learn as efficiently from pixel inputs as from state input. So going six months back, here's what the state of the art roughly looked like. Uh, horizontal axis, number of training steps of the reinforcement learning algorithm in the environment, vertical axis, reward accumulated on average per episode, higher is better. The blue curve is when the reinforcement learning agent gets to learn from state, which of course as roboticists uh, we know is the kind of most succinct summary of the situation that the agent is faced with. And then in green are two learning curves where the agent has access to pixels only. And so clearly there's a gap. And the question we asked ourselves is, can we bridge that gap or at least bridge it to great extent? And the reason we thought maybe it's possible the bridge it is because of all the progress in unsupervised learning in computer vision. And so I'll tell you about Curl and Rad, which are extending these ideas into reinforcement learning. But let me tell you more first about the progress in computer vision. So for the longest time, computer vision has been uh, dominated by successes from learning in a purely supervised way on ImageNet data set, um, new network architectures and so forth, better results. Now, what we've seen in 2019 and then even more so in 2020 is results that show it's possible to do even better than supervised learning by combining supervised with unsupervised learning. And so on the left here, the blue plot is accuracy on vertical axis, horizontal axis is amount of labeled data. 
And blue is when you also do unsupervised learning and red is only supervised. And we see that thanks to the unsupervised training, you can outperform a purely supervised approach. The plot on the right is showing, showing something similar for SimClear, which is the latest approach that has had some great success. SimClear is actually one of the simplest approaches also. So let me explain how that one works. In SimClear, in addition to doing supervised learning, you do unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning, you take in an image, but you're not given a label. So how are you gonna do something with that image that your neural net can learn from? You come up with a few hard-coded primitives of augmenting your image. So in this case, we have a dog image. We augment it by cropping, which is a new image on the left that we automatically can generate and then recolor it on the right. And on the left, it's also mirrored. But then the neural net's supposed to process both of these augmentations of the original image into a latent encoding, ZI and ZJ. And because they came from the same image, these encodings should agree, should be similar. In this case, they should have a high inner product between ZI and ZJ. Um, on the contrary, um, if you were to feed in another image, let's say, you know, now it's a cat or something, but you don't know it, the embeddings of the cat image should be far away from the embeddings of the dog image. But really what it is, is every image is supposed to be close to its own augmentations and far away from other augmentations of other images. So you don't need any labels to do this. And it turns out that boosts supervised learning performance quite drastically. So how can we now apply this in reinforcement learning? In reinforcement learning, we have an agent, collects experiences, they go into a replay buffer. Then you take your experience out of the replay buffer, a sequence of frames, in this case, three frames. And normally you'd follow just a top path. You get processed through a neural network, which is supposed to predict the correct action to take through the actor and predict the value function through the critic. Now, in addition, we're going to have the bottom path, which does essentially the same thing SimClear does. Augmentations happen of the original observations, and then a contrastive loss is applied to learn to embed those um, augmentations close together when they come from the same original and far apart if they come from different originals. It's a couple of detailed questions we have to answer though, listed there, so let's step through those. You need to choose how to do your augmentation. We found that just cropping is actually the most effective, even though the original SimClear paper had many other um, augmentation aspects that were effective in ImageNet uh, computer vision recognition context for these robotic control tasks here, cropping was the one that mattered. Then when you measure similarity, we found empirically that just using inner product between the embeddings of the two uh, augmentations was not good enough. We needed a weighting matrix in the middle there, W that's also learned, which leads to the much better learning curve illustrated here for Cheetah, but same is true for other environments. And the third thing is that you can, um, so actually another paper came out around the same time as SimClear Moco from Kaiming He and collaborators at Facebook. And it's very similar to SimClear. The main difference is that there is a momentum term on the encoding for the key encodings. And it turns out that can um, both make the training more effective in terms of signal propagation, but also in terms of uh, memory management. And so in our case also, we found that using this momentum encoding can help. That's the red learning curve, which is better than without momentum encoding. So now let's take a look at the results. Remember what we set out to investigate is why do we need to learn from state? Why can't we do equally well directly from pixels? Here are the learning curves on 16 environments where the gray learning curve corresponds to having direct access to state, the red learning curve corresponds to having access to pixels only. In this case, a sequence of three frames because these are robotic tasks. And if you've only one frame, you don't really see anything about velocity. So it's helpful to have a sequence of three frames, consider that your visual state. And so we see that in most of these environments, these are deep mind control suite environments, which builds upon Mujoko. Uh, learning from pixels is almost as efficient as learning from state. Now, 
for do a more detailed comparison with prior work. Um, on the left here, we, so we're plotting median scores over a range of environments. Blue is after 100,000 time steps, red after 500,000 time steps. The first one is learning from state using soft actor critic as an RL algorithm. Curl also uses soft actor critic, but learns from pixels and has a contrastive loss in addition. The very last one in this graph, pixel sac, is also soft actor critic from pixels, but without the contrastive loss. So we see that indeed the contrastive loss helps a lot and in fact brings it close to efficiency of learning from state. Then the most similar methods to curl are slack v1 and sac plus AE. Slack v1 is soft actor critic with a auxiliary loss that is video prediction. And SAC plus AE is an autoencoder auxiliary loss. And we see that also helps, but not as much as the contrastive losses. And then Planet and Dreamer are state-of-the-art uh, model-based RL methods, which also are designed to work well from pixels, but in this case get outperformed by model-free approaches with um, unsupervised losses. You might wonder, well, what are some of the most important aspects? And in particular, the question we looked at is, there are a few environments in which curl does not manage to do as well as learning from state. So we looked at those environments and we actually ran for much longer, for a million time steps, for a hundred million time steps. And we noticed that even asymptotically, learning from pixels could not match learning from state in those environments. So that led us to believe that maybe the reason we couldn't learn as effectively from pixels is because the signal just doesn't exist in those environments. That looking just at the image frames, you do not have access to enough information compared to what you get from true state. And so then we ran an experiment. We said, okay, let's take a successful RL run from state, store the frames, run supervised learning on the frames from three frames, to state and see how well that works. And indeed we found that even supervised learning could not extract state from the image stack. And so this indeed then confirmed for us that this environments where it, the pixel-based learning cannot match state-based learning were environments where the state is simply not available to extract, at least not with the neural net architectures that we tried and we tried quite a few things the state could not be extracted from a three frame uh, sequence. And if you're wondering what might be under the hood there, um, for some of them, it clearly has to do with uh, contact forces that might be useful. So that could be one of the things that is just too hard to extract from just three frame sequence. Another question you could ask is, can we do contrastive learning independently of reinforcement learning? So, the standard curl approach has both the reinforcement learning loss and the contrastive loss propagate into the uh, first layers of the network that do the representation learning. What if we don't let RL loss propagate into that? Only representation learning can happen there. Um, we can see it doesn't do as well. It's shown in green when it's detached like that, but it's still doing pretty well. So this could be, um, so it wouldn't be your preferred way to go if you have access to an RL loss, but imagine you're in a multitask environment or in an environment where you don't know yet what the reward is going to be. You could already do some effective representation learning ahead of time before the reward starts coming in. Now, as we had these results, one thing we started wondering is, um, to which extent is it the contrastive loss that matters versus maybe it's just a data augmentation, just the data augmentation is so valuable that maybe that's all we need. And this is some work that we did simultaneously and independently of uh, very similar work done at NYU, which they call Dr. Q. Um, we call it RAD. And what we do here is we do pure RL from pixels, but before feeding the three frame stack into the reinforced learning neural network, we do data augmentation. And we do a wide range of data augmentation, though again, cropping tends to be the most important one, but we use a wide range of data augmentations. We found that actually this slightly outperforms curl on the DeepMind control suite, both on the 100,000 and the 500,000 uh, time steps benchmark. So it's very interesting. And data augmentation is really key to having either unsupervised or RL 
learn really good representations from pixels that allow it to be as efficient as learning from state. And here we compare with other methods again, as before, Planet and Dreamer to state-of-the-art model-based RL methods for the DeepMind control suite, SAC plus autoencoder and Slack v1, which we covered earlier, and then directly learning from pixels and directly learning from state. And in fact, often here, we even have data augmentation, RAD, outperform learning from state directly, which is pretty interesting too, um, that we actually learn more efficiently from pixels than from state. You might wonder how can that be possible? State is the thing that we know as roboticists is the most succinct representation of the uh, situation in the world to predict the future. The reason that's likely happening though we haven't fully verified this is because um, when we learn from state, in principle, we could also do data augmentation. For example, translation, ver vertical and horizontal data translation could still be um, applied in learning from state on some of the state variables. And it might be that we get some benefit there in image augmentations that we are not infusing, or well, really nobody's infusing in learning from state right now, but that we could apply there too. Okay, so here are the learning curves comparing rad and blue, which is just RL with data augmentation, in red, RL with contrastive learning, curl, and then in gray, state-based. Uh, soft actor critic. If you want to take a look under the hood, what is the neural net paying attention to? Which augmentations matter the most? Uh, it's clear that cropping matters the most in terms of making the neural network pay attention to where the robot is in the image. So what we covered is um, how we might be able to get a reinforced learning agent to learn as efficiently from images as we can learn from state through two approaches, curl, which does RL plus contrastive learning, rad, with, which does RL with augmented data. Now you might wonder um, between the two of them, given that rad matches and even slightly outperforms curl, uh, you know, why, why bother with curl? Well, the reason rad probably outperforms curl is because it gets to focus on the task at hand. There is no auxiliary loss coming in. Everything is the reinforcement learning loss. In curl, we have the auxiliary loss that's unsupervised, which might distract a little bit from the reinforcement learning loss. On the flip side, what if there is no reward yet? What if you have random rollouts or you have multitask learning? In those settings, it's less clear that um, what you would do with pure RAD, because you might have to just throw out some data where there is no reward yet. Whereas with contrastive learning, you can already use that data to learn a good representation that later might be useful for whatever task you need to solve later or new tasks in the multitask setting that might come in later after you've already learned other tasks. What's missing? Um, well, everything we looked at here is really looking at image single image or a stack of three frames, which is a very short sequence. So it's really representation learning of pixels to state. And that's only one type of representation learning that matters in reinforcement learning. Uh, other type of representation learning that would matter is learning to represent interesting behaviors, like is touching an object an interesting thing to do? Is grasping an object an interesting thing to do? Is opening a door an interesting thing to do? Those are the kind of representations that we imagine uh, would play a pretty big role in uh, future work along this line, but that is not leveraged at all in this work so far. Another thing that's clearly missing, look at the gap between left and right. On the left, we see real images for people using computer vision. Um, on the right, we see DeepMind control suite images, which are a lot simpler than real world imagery. And so it'd be interesting to see now, how well this can work on real world data, maybe the kind of data sets Chelsea just presented, the RoboNet images might be a large enough data set where it could study similar things and maybe you know, do well despite much additional complexity of the visual uh, space that we see in real world versus these deep mind control suite environments. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, uh, for this uh, really uh, thought provoking talk. Um, and our next speaker.
Um, it's Andy Zeng. I'm uh, very happy to introduce Andy. Andy is a research scientist at Google Robotics, um, at Google AI, and he's working in Vision for Robotics. He received his PhD uh, from Princeton and a bachelor from UC Berkeley. He's interested in developing learning algorithms that uh, enable machine to, machines to intelligently interact with the physical world. And he has successfully participated in the Amazon uh, challenges, for example, the pick and place uh, challenge. And his work has involved reasoning about how to simulate objects for better grasping. Um, he has explored uh, learning physical properties of objects and, for example, letting them slide down the ramp and collide with others so that uh, 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 and he has also taught uh, robots uh, how to toss objects successfully. And Andy is also a recipient of multiple awards for his work. Um, Andy, back to you. Thanks for the introduction, Anelia. Uh, yeah, and thanks for having me for this talk. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Also a great talk by Peter. Uh, I still remember taking Peter's intro to AI course back then when I was an undergrad at Berkeley. Uh, one, is one of the uh, things that motivated me to pursue a career in research, so that was very inspiring. Okay, so hey everybody, uh, I'm Andy, and today I'd like to talk about some of our recent work in vision-based manipulation. So recently we've seen a lot of deep learning success in simulation, and I think a lot of us are motivated to see these things, uh, these agents do stuff in the real world. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges in doing that is figuring out how do we get our training labels. Uh, in simulation, it's pretty clear because we have uh, reward functions that we can engineer, but then with real hardware, it can be pretty difficult because human labeling can get pretty tedious and expensive. So I think that uh, self-supervised learning has an important role to play here in helping us autonomously generate uh, useful data um, so that our models can improve themselves over time, making them more practical to deploy in the real world. So to illustrate some of these points today, I wanted to walk us through uh, a simple example and use it as a way to introduce some of our work that uses self-supervised learning. So to start out, imagine a task where the goal is to pick up the red block and put it into the fixture. Uh, this is what it would look like if the robot was successfully doing it, in this case with the suction gripper. And because we're doing vision-based manipulation, we want to effectively do this from images. So say that this top-down view here is our input image. So then a hard-nosed roboticist might say that the best thing to do for vision here is just pose estimation. Uh, and that might be true for many structured industrial settings. So then we define canonical poses for the objects in the scene, one for the block and one for the fixture. And then you go back to your computer and you design a pose estimation algorithm that predicts poses from images, right? And so it's, uh, since it's 2020, what better way to do that than with neural nets? Uh, so then we slap on a convolutional neural net, tweak the architecture a bit so that it could better fit within our pose estimation pipeline. This was essentially what we tried to do for the Amazon picking challenge a few years ago, uh, where we used convolutional networks to predict segmentation masks for objects. Uh, then we aligned the masks to their 3D object models to get a 6D pose. Uh, since then, there have been many follow-up works that have come up with much more elegant architectures than what we had for doing this. But one of the pain points here was collecting training data. I don't know how many of you have had to label 3D data before, but it is hard. Designing and using a 2D interface to label in 3D uh, while also trying to be as accurate as possible is incredibly time consuming. So one of the things that we did to augment our data was to make use of our robot. Uh, since we already had a camera equipped with our robot end effector, we could move the camera through a series of predefined configurations. And since our industrial robots are really accurate, uh, we can get the camera rigid transforms for free from the calibrated movements of the robot and propagate our training labels from one view to all the other views in the scene. Um, and that's how we can get lots more data from just a handful of labels. You could also apply this idea to get a bunch of correspondence labels for free from 3D reconstruction algorithms and SLAM data sets. Uh, you could also easily try to scale up both poses and segmentation data uh, as Label Fusion was able to show this was work done for my colleagues at MIT. 
Uh, and also not my work, but I think is really clever is using multi-view to scale up data collection for transparent objects uh, by replacing them physically with opaque objects and then taking advantage of highly repeatable robot movements to capture the same exact views with a 3D camera so that you can now get ground truth depth data for those transparent objects. Uh, this was recent work done from my colleagues at Google. So object pose estimation, in many ways it's great. Uh, when you know beforehand all of the rigid objects that you'd be manipulating. But then as you collect training data for your model, you might start to realize that not everything in the world is a rigid body with a canonical pose. Our world is full of random things like articulated objects, deformables, piles of stuff, fluids. And in general, object-centric representations like object poses are fundamentally limited by what we are able to define as objects. So, if we took a step back to think about a vision method that might actually scale to the complexity of the real world, I think there is a good case here for end-to-end -end learning where we just directly try to map from pixels to actions. So to illustrate why this is interesting, let's go back to our simple example and suppose that the way that we've parameterized our actions is with a picking pose t-pick and a placing pose t-place for the suction cup gripper, uh, where an example could be suctioning one leg of the L-shaped block and then placing it to a corresponding location in the fixture. And the nice part about this is that this end-to-end -end formulation doesn't make any assumptions of objectness, meaning that we don't assume an explicit definition for what an object is. And that actually leads to some nice benefits. For example, in this task, there are other low-level visual cues that the robot can learn from that might enable it to succeed just as well, like that corners match to corners or that edges align to edges and the cool part is that these features might actually be more generalizable to new scenarios. So for example, if suddenly our object and fixture both grew bigger in size, then these features could still apply. Uh, or if we had different shapes of objects, they could also still apply as well. So I think that rather than thinking about vision as a bunch of poses, I think that we can instead learn how to rely more on these low level features. And that actually gives us an opportunity to generalize and scale to new tasks. So we touched on this idea in our recent work called Form to Fit. And the key idea was that for assembly tasks, which involve inserting objects into corresponding holes into a kit, uh, you could essentially learn generalizable vision-based pick and place policies by formulating the problem as a shape matching problem. Uh, so in this case, we would make a pixel-wise prediction of local visual shape descriptors, and then use that to match picking actions to placing actions. And here's a visualization of the learned descriptors projected into color space. And what you would see is that different parts of the same object would match to different parts of the placement location that it would be fit into. And intuitively, you can think of this as learning the general concept of how things fit together, which is quite powerful for a lot of industrial assembly tasks. Um, in this work, we showed that learning generalizable shape descriptors allows us to generalize uh, and assemble unseen kits with new objects. Another interesting aspect is that for assembly tasks, it's often a lot easier to take apart something than to put it back together. Uh, so we came up with a way to do self-supervised learning where the robot would first learn how to disassemble the kit by trial and error. And then simply by time reversing the sequences of actions, we now effectively have training data for assembly as well. So in our setting, this only works for quasi-static pick and place tasks, but it'd be interesting to see how we can uh, apply this to cases where there are non-reversible dynamics. And this project was done by Kevin Saka, who's now studying at Stanford. But zooming back out, uh, in terms of these two vision-based formulations, I think both pose estimation and end-to-end -end are incredibly similar. We're essentially trying to train a high capacity model to map from pixels to some compact group, and that could either be poses or actions. But I think what distinguishes the two the most is that with pose estimation, there's usually a one-to-one -one correspondence between poses and the objects that you see. Uh, whereas with actions, you could potentially have a very complex policy distribution that you're trying to model. So in other words, in pose estimation, you typically only have one right answer. Uh, but then with end-to-end -end learning, there can be many right answers. And just to be clear, there's also a spectrum of different action spaces for end-to-end -end learning. Uh, but in this talk, I'll, I'll mostly focus on Cartesian spatial action spaces, 
uh, like predicting end effector locations for manipulation or end points for motion primitives. And I actually think that this action space holds a lot of promise compared to the others uh, because it naturally lives in the same domain as the state, uh, which allows you to leverage uh, equivariance and allows you to exploit some of the symmetries in the data for a lot more sample efficient learning and generalization. Uh, I'll talk about some of that in the coming slides. So if we go back to our simple example where we'd like to train an end-to-end -end model for this task, uh, the thing to recognize here is that the set of picking poses is effectively a distribution. And it might look something like this if we visualized it like a heat map. And then the set of successful picks would basically cover the surface of the object. Um, and we want our end effector picking pose T pick to be sampled from this distribution. Uh, the challenge here for our model is then, how can we recover this distribution with high accuracy and fidelity? And this is actually a tricky problem. Uh, even in just the simple grasping with the suction cup setting, these distributions can actually get quite complex depending on the shape of the objects or the physics of the suction. So for example, if uh, here we draw a few object shapes with the uh, distribution of successful suction grasps overlaid on top in red. Uh, it can be highly multimodal in nature, depending on the number of objects in the scene. Uh, it can be oddly shaped, highly non-isotropic. Uh, imagine if you're trying to grasp a donut, uh, the distribution might follow the contour of the object. Or sometimes maybe not because of suction physics, and maybe some part of the object might be too thin or maybe porous. Um, keep in mind that I've drawn these distributions with clean edges, but between the red and the gray, uh, but usually these boundaries are much smoother and noisier than this with some stochasticity because of physics. So then also depending on your embodiment or your end effector, for example, if it was two finger grasping, uh, then the distribution of successful grasps can become even more complex, uh, maybe even multimodal on different parts of the same object due to symmetries. Um, or in the case of the donut, the distribution is actually spiral shaped through the space of SE2 uh, as the gripper follows the ring of the donut. So the vision-based grasping problem, for example, is essentially how can we recover these distributions from images? And sort of the beauty of vision-based manipulation is that this structure of visual data can provide us with amazing priors for learning this. So say that for example, because of a particular embodiment or a specific setting, uh, your ground truth grasping distribution looks something crazy like this. Um, like you could totally try to train an implicit function with regression to memorize this distribution, uh, but then you will need a bunch of data samples, right? Both positives and negatives to be able to carve this out of the air to fit the function. Um, but then it's just a heck of a lot easier if your input data just looked like this. Uh, now suddenly you have an input bias that helps you a lot and maybe just with two data samples, you can already figure out that what lies on the object is good, what does not is bad. Um, so then you can learn uh, to fit the function a lot more efficiently. The main idea here is that it's easier to learn these distributions if they're directly anchored on the visual features in the image, like the shapes and boundaries of objects, because they can provide really helpful inductive biases. Um, and also so that you could essentially leverage equivariance here to exploit symmetries in the data. So then how do we implement this in practice? Uh, luckily for us, this problem formulation is quite similar to image segmentation stuff that computer vision people have recently made incredibly, incredible progress on, uh, where your input is an image and your output is a dense prediction with a one-to-one -one pixel correspondence to the input. And the key aspect here is that the network is fully convolutional, where every layer is a convolutional layer, so that uh, equivariance is preserved, where every pixel in the output corresponds to a decision being made with respect to a chunk of pixels in the input. Uh, so that as you translate over your input space, you're effectively translating over the output space as well. So then we can use these same mechanics to give us a dense prediction of the spatial distribution of successful grasps. Uh, and we call these affordance predictions inspired by Gibson's work in psychology. Uh, essentially, we're trying to model a value function per pixel action that correlates with picking success uh, in this particular case with the suction cup. And this is what we did to win the stowing task at the Amazon Picking Challenge, uh, the second time that we participated, where we were the only team to have successfully grasped all the new objects that Amazon had in this version of the competition. Uh, and the way that we amassed training data for this was by going on a shopping spree at Target and buying over 200 different items to train the robot to learn grasping. 
since then, we've had some follow-up work that uses the same kind of dense spatial action representation. And as it turns out, it makes learning a lot more efficient for reinforcement learning of navigation and mobile manipulation tasks. Uh, it also enables learning complex pushing policies to make grasping easier in less than a few hours of robot interaction time. Uh, and also jointly learning both grasping and tossing. In both the second and the third work, we used self-supervision to train the robots. Um, where in the first work, we primarily had grasping labels uh, from checking the width between the gripper fingers and then propagated the reward to the pushing actions through reinforcement. Uh, and for tossing bot, we used an overhead camera to track where the object lands to self-supervise the tossing part, uh, tossing part of the model. Uh, and in both cases, we leveraged hardware resets during the training process uh, so that much of it all was completely hands-free. So uh, this is the network architecture for tossing bot, which follows a standard encoder decoder structure to predict grasping affordances and another decoder to predict residual throwing velocities. Uh, one thing that we were interested in was finding out what tossing bot had learned by extracting the intermediate pixel-wise features from this model. Uh, when we visualized nearest neighbor clusters in this feature representation, uh, we found that interestingly, TossingBot learns to cluster the visual latent features based on object properties. So here we visualize two of these clusters, one that seems to correspond to ping pong balls and another that seemed to correspond to marker pens. And we observed that objects that share similar shapes as well as physical properties uh, like mass and aerodynamics, they often cluster closely together inside of this feature embedding space. Um, because these are features that would influence how the object should be thrown. And to me, the uh, interesting part is that these emerging features were learned implicitly from scratch without any explicit supervision for what an object is. Uh, but here, through sort of self-supervised interaction, grasping and tossing, uh, the robot has implicitly learned to distinguish between ping pong balls and marker pens. Um, and I think that this experiment speaks out to a broader concept, which is uh, how should our robots learn the semantics of the visual world? Um, at the beginning of this talk, I spoke a lot about object pose estimation, which is how we've been doing vision for quite some time in robotics, uh, partially because uh, it's assumed as the first step for all of our control and dynamics algorithms. Um, object poses are great, especially in structured settings. But then like very many other computer vision tasks, it relies on our human definition of what an object is and what our class categories should be, uh, which in and of itself can be rather limited. But as we move towards end-to-end -end learning, I think some of our earlier experiments with tossing bot suggest that it's possible for our robots to pick up their own definition of objects through physical interactions alone. And the more complex these interactions then the higher the resolution of your definitions. So then to more generally intelligent robots, I think that self-supervised learning might be the key here to uh, enabling our robots to develop their own notion of semantics through interaction without any human guidance. Um, and I think it's particularly exciting to think about ways in which we can tackle the vision problem where objectness is something that emerges as a byproduct rather than a fundamental assumption. And with that, I'd like to thank all my collaborators from Princeton, MIT, Stanford, and Google. Uh, and that's it. Thanks for listening. Happy, happy to take questions during the panel discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Andy, for this interesting talk. Um, so now we will take a five minutes uh, break, and we'll resume with the panel in exactly five minutes. Thanks, everyone.
Okay, um, welcome back. We will proceed with our panel. Um, let's wait a bit to have all participants join in. Um, okay, so um, our panel consists of our speakers in the second part. Uh, thank you very much for your um, great uh, talks. We'll have uh, Chelsea Finn, uh, Peter Abil, Roberto Calandra, and Andy Zeng. Um, to get started, um, let's, let's uh, go towards the challenges. And I have a question. What are the biggest challenges that you think that we need to overcome to give the robots a maximum boost in capability? I can give that a stab, but that's a pretty hard question to answer. Um, but maybe I'll just call out one direction. I think we've seen a lot of progress in, um, in some sense, relatively simple exploration objectives being quite effective, where you say, you know, maximum mutual information between a latent variable and um, states achieved, things like that. Essentially, racial intrinsic control type objectives. Originally, I think most was a paper from DeepMind. And I think it's gotten some good success, but I think it's still quite limiting. And I think there's a lot more to be thought about there to somehow encourage more interesting exploratory behaviors uh, when you just leave robots on their own. Um, it's right now not very likely they would build a nice tower or would try to assemble something if just left on their own. Those are the kind of things that they would not naturally explore, um, at least not with the current kind of as mildly supervised objectives as possible that people have come up with. And so be better exploration objectives for self-supervised exploration would be one direction. That's pretty important. Yeah, so Zoli, um, are there thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree that actually like collecting like more interesting and sophisticated interactions in an automated way is an important problem. I also think that even if we did have really scalable means to collect lots of really interesting data, um, we wouldn't necessarily have algorithms that could learn many different tasks from that data. We've seen self-supervision be successful for things like grasping, where you can get labels uh, from the data itself. But for more general purpose tasks, I think it's a lot more difficult to do. Um, we've been developing approaches based on model-based RL and have had some success with that. Uh, but as I mentioned in my talk, underfitting is, is, is definitely a challenge that we see there. And I think we need to think critically about, um, about actually learning many different tasks from those sorts of data. Yeah, so you're bringing another big question. That's actually a question that Chelsea asked in her talk. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we scale? Uh, and not, not only thinking about many um, robots, or many environments, but also thinking about tasks that are very diverse. So navigation task versus grasping task. 
Yeah, so uh, Chelsea made a great point, which is that self-supervision has really been shown for much simpler tasks like grasping. And once you move to harder tasks uh, with much more long horizon, it's much harder to get a robot to wiggle its way into victory, right? So, so um, I think that demonstrations could potentially be, uh, or at least exploring a little bit more how we can learn from humans uh, better. Um, and I think that just broadly applicable to um, work where you're teleoperating the robot or if you're just learning from, for example, third person demonstrations from YouTube. I think that is sort of a good source of trying to find ways in which we can get robots to learn these more complex things. So, so you're suggesting, sorry, to, to suggesting to combine with some weak supervision or some demonstrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, a little bit of both, I think, would, would be helpful. Yeah, um, sorry, I interrupted. Personally, I'm very interested, and in, I don't think it's an easy problem. I think it's actually one of the hardest problems we have. Uh, but uh, I think that hierarchical learning um, is something that would uh, potentially be a solution to many of these issues of uh, long-term planning and, uh, and, and also <coughs> task. Um, I, I think this, this has been for a very long time sort of a holy grail. If we could you know, automatically learn sub-tasks and then compose them for achieving higher level tasks, that would be great. Uh, and if we could do it in a self-supervised manner, it would be even better. Uh, but it's a really difficult problem. Any other thoughts on bridging the gap to diverse tasks? Okay, I would like to follow up with um, a question of uh, following on Peter's comment um, that, yeah, it's true that uh, some of those interactions, they don't lead to very sophisticated goals. Uh, so how can we have a sort of a curriculum in how we do our self-supervised learning. Um, and maybe as Andy's pointing out, maybe we'll have still human guide that, but how, how do you see that happening? Meaning giving more and more complex tasks for our self-supervised robot to achieve. Well, um, I think one of the, I mean, there, there are definitely some tricks that can be played, but I think if we want to do it as self-supervised as possible, then I think what um, Andy was already alluding to in terms of watching videos that are out there could be pretty powerful. I mean, there is a lot of video out there, probably more video than a neural net can meaningfully process or today's neural nets can meaningfully process. You might need some pre-processing to decide which videos are even relevant for let's say robotic manipulation or for driving or you know you're probably still train something somewhat specialized to one of those things but it i mean and i think it's i mean it might not feel super self-supervised the way pure rl would be but i think at the same time it's okay um look at humans we, we don't do nearly as much reinforcement learning as we do imitation learning almost everything we know is you know learned from parents or seeing other people do it um, it's not learned in that somebody is teleoperating us. So it's you know, learned in a third person way and, and thinking through how our body might be able to do something that we see some other body do. So there's a lot of complications to it beyond the standard imitation learning setting. But I do think it's, you know, it's reasonable, especially with so many videos out there, it's quite reasonable to hope that that could work. So one related thing I might want to point out is this work um, Rohin Shah at Berkeley recently led. And the, the kind of cute idea was how to learn from one snapshot, one snapshot of the world. And this goes into inverse reinforcement learning. Like what are reasonable reward functions that can explain what we see in the world? And the idea being that if you see three blocks stacked in the world, it's likely that somebody cares about stacking those blocks because any random behavior around those three blocks would have had them scattered on the floor. And so that it might not even need video. So video would give you the how, but 
to just get the final reward, goal-related reward, just snapshots of the world might be enough to understand what is typically a good thing to care about versus, you know, things people would not care about. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and another question I want to ask all of you is regarding safety and um, self-supervised exploration, something Roberto brought up. Um, so how how do we do this uh, in a nice, meaningful way with two points to this question? First is um, you don't want the robot as it explores to, to damage itself. And second, uh, around people, right? For example, a self-driving car cannot explore like that. Um, I think that there are sort of two ways of tackling this problem at the high level. One, one solution is sort of the empirical solution, which is just to hack around uh, some solution that, you know, with a lot of safety constraints so that we are not trying to, you know, to kill people or, or you know, hurt somebody with our arms or whatever. Um, from a more technically and, and scientific perspective, I think that's something that would be uh, very interesting. And there has already been a lot of work in, in this direction uh, is uh, is essentially safe learning. So how can we learn while making sure uh, that, for example, uh, our uncertainty over what's happening is limited so that I'm not going to do something that I, I have no idea what's happening. And the original concept is sort of very, very old because already um, already in the work from Stefan Schall, uh, like more than 20 years ago, there was this idea of you know, okay, and divergence. You don't want to really move far away from what you have seen before. Uh, so of course now there are more advanced technique, but the basic idea I think was already there. One thing that's interesting about safety in manipulation is that you could build the best collision avoidance system possibly ever that just avoids all surfaces. But then sometimes, well, manipulation is about touching objects and potentially pushing them away and breaking them apart in order to make grasping easier, for example. And an uh, interesting thought was that um, maybe uh, one of the limitations of our systems today is that we just don't have the sensor suite that humans have. Like we have this huge massive organ called skin <laughs> that that is able to sense collisions for us, but then also, uh, you know, some damping and, and allows us to uh, sense when something's hurting us and when it's not and helps us really push the bounds for how far we can manipulate without destroying something. And I think that, um, Frankly, in terms of hardware, we're, we're also not quite there yet. So I think that there's a lot of work that could be done there. One other thing I'll add with regard to getting data um, is, well, first of like autonomous driving settings, I think that we already have tons of data of that. I think that getting data from humans for that is actually pretty easy. Uh, so if we can figure out how to do safe learning, like what Roberto was talking about, then I don't think we have to worry about exploration that's safe. Uh, and in the context of of robotic manipulation. I, I like what, what Andy was saying. And I think that perhaps one viewpoint that's maybe a bit different is, well, if you think about all the ro robot experiments that people, different people have done at different labs, um, if we had just stored all of the data from those experiments, maybe we, we would already have a lot of interesting and sophisticated interactions um, of robots in different environments. And so maybe we should just be storing all of our data and figuring out algorithms that can learn from these diverse data sources of robots with different action spaces and different environments and so forth. Uh, and if we could do that, then we wouldn't actually have to worry about the problem of exploration at all. We just keep on doing what we're doing to eventually accumulate a large enough data set and then run our algorithms on that data set rather than worrying about exploration. Yeah, that's a great point. Um... And yeah, we have to agree, we have to think about how we, we share data among all labs. Um, another question. For, um, Sorry, I, I would also like to make a counter argument though. Um, in many cases, the fastest learning happen when you are intentionally doing things that are very dangerous. Um, 
in, in, in new ones. So for example, um, something that I've seen with my own eyes is that uh, learning to ski, the people that learn best how to ski are the people that essentially go like crazy. You know, you would say, oh, this person is gonna kill himself. And, and then turns out that no, it's actually, you know, collecting more data, it's collecting a wider domain of data is simply more efficiently. Uh, so I think that it, it conceptually it's, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, philosophy that maybe we do actually want to explore very aggressively as long as we don't completely destroy, you know, the robot. And maybe having, as Andy was suggesting, mechanical compliance or other type of compliances, that's actually the solution that sort of limit when we really are going over uh, you know, the limit. I also don't think that point is necessarily at odds with what I was saying either. I think that we should also kind of record all those failures as well. I've, I've certainly broken robots in my time before uh, and, and we should record all of that and, and learn from, from those failures. Yeah, that's a great point. And another question, um, uh, how do we use more state instead of pixels in those self-supervised, uh, hopefully joint experiments among labs? I think that one of the beautiful things about deep learning, which I think a lot of us are using these days, is that it is in many ways agnostic to what you feed in. Um, and I think that a lot of the algorithms that we are developing, you can feed in different sorts of sensor modalities and so forth, and things should be able to, to still work. Uh, although there probably are also methods that can actually explicitly leverage and uh, do things that are special and explicitly leverage the fact that you have multiple views of the same state, whether it be tactile, visual, and so forth, and some of the work that um, that others um, and Roberto have been working on, for example, I think uh, really take advantage of that. Um, cool, and time flies, unfortunately. Um, I would uh, wanna ask like a final question to all of you and um, uh, let, let's leave it at that. It's a very interesting discussion nevertheless. Um, how do we uh, evaluate um, self-supervised learning? So that means like, how do we benchmark? How do we compare to, to each other? Right. So I think the self-supervision has to probably be measured against something that's supervised afterwards. I mean, it's, it's nice to watch videos of you know, exploratory behaviors and say this one is more diverse than that one. And I think that that's great in the initial stages of research to get a sense for, is this even working at all? But then ultimately it comes down to, you know, does the self-supervised learning generalize to something that is an actual task, whether it's an imitation task or a reinforcement learning task. And so I think it's tricky because, well, yeah, whatever task you pick in the end, it's probably easier to directly design against that task and lose and then you lose the focus on, you know, how self-supervised the learning really is that leads up to it. So it, it probably requires some good amount of discipline and thinking about how to ensure that you don't, you know, really supervise it by knowing what the task is going to be that you get evaluated on, but there hopefully should be a way. Um, okay, uh, thank you all very much once more for a uh, very interesting, intriguing uh, talks and a uh, very fruitful discussion um, and uh, thanks for your participation and we'll continue now with uh, discussing the second half of the contributed papers thank you, thank you. So I'm uh, supposed to begin. <laughs> yes, I was just um, going to ask. You Thanks. You, you want to go ahead, please? Okay. So uh, 
uh, I'm a PhD student at the Technion Israel under the supervision of Vadim. Uh, we're currently working on object level SLAM with continuous object uh, representation. Uh, the idea is to learn an, ob an observation model over object detections in an unsupervised way, giving rise to an object embedding where each object instance corresponds to a continuous vector in the learned latent space. At runtime, we use the learned model to perform inference in this latent representation space. We formulate the learning for viewpoint dependent models, which involve the robot poses and thus couple semantic and geometric inference. Since the learning is appearance-based, it does not require semantic information about the objects, so in principle could allow to perform object-level SLAM without class information, just based on object detections and some available associations between them. The formulated learning process could be manipulated to shape the latent space to allow for easier mapping back to object categories and to encourage viewpoint dependency to allow more precise localization inference. Thank you very much. Can I ask uh, Marvin, please, to present the paper real quick? Oh, yes. Hi, everyone. So my name is Marvin. I am a PhD student at Queensland University of Technology in Australia. And in this paper, we propose a robotic system for, liber for learning while driving navigation tasks at city scale using real data, which is also capable to generalize to drastic environmental changes such as day to night cycles, for example. So in contrast with recent supervised learning approaches that basically rely on the quality of GPS data for image labeling, we propose the use of self-supervised learning for capturing motion and visual representations by unifying three successful robotic systems. So in particular, our method temporarily integrates motion states with visual observations in a self-supervised manner that can then be use it to training for training and navigation policy using reinforcement learning. So for motion estimation, we use visual odometry. And to encode raw images, we use deep learning based visual localization models. So finally, in the paper, we demonstrate our method on two large scale driving data sets where we show that it is capable of accurately generalized from day to night with up to 80% success rate compared to 30% for a visual-only navigation system. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Then next up is uh, Francesco. Yeah, here. Can you hear me, guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm Francesco. I'm postdoc at the Sapienza University of Rome. And um, the paper you're presenting here has a very intuitive idea. So what we want to do is to mimic the human ability to operate in partial observability and particularly to extend the knowledge beyond the sensory horizon of, of the robots and to, to fill the gap in missing knowledge. And so specifically, our goal is to collect a continuous stream of data, to store it in a replay buffer of time coverated samples and to, and to predict the future observation that the robot is going to perceive at a given time point in the future. So in other words, we want to give the robot the ability to um, answer the question, uh, given a sequence of data, data that I'm perceiving right now, what, what is the next observation, how the next observation is going to look like at a given time point in the future? So to this end, what we, we do is to take advantage, advantage of two main players, which one is the gener generative adversarial network, and the other one is the variational decoder. The former is used to learn the target distribution of next observation that we want to learn, while the latter is equally important because we use that to, to learn a compact yet informative presentation of the robot observation, and this allows us to actually embed uh, and reduce the third dimensionality of the problem to learn uh, and to make the task easier to generate learning. As we show in the results, we, we have an, a good uh, prediction of next scans, of next, next observations, but still it's not really um, uh, accurate to support low level planning, which was our initial plan. And right now we are moving to a higher level decision-making leverage to support planning at a high level. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Then uh, finally, we have uh, Mangi. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, hi everyone. So we present a self-supervised scene for estimation method for temporal point clouds. Now the motivation of our work is that we is that the current state of the art methods they actually require the same flow annotations for every point in the point cloud, which is quite costly to obtain. So we come up with a method which uh, estimates the scene flow in a self-supervised manner using a nearest neighbor loss and cycle consistency loss. So this method will be helpful in estimating the scene flow on real world, large scale, unlabeled autonomous driving data set. Now in the work, we have a temporal sequence of two point clouds and we consider a cyclic assumption, which is that if a point moves forward in time and then comes back, it has to reach the same starting point. So we experiment this method on two data sets, that is new scenes and kitty. And we see that if we fine tune our method on a small label data set like ET, we are able to outperform the other supervised methods. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, everyone. So there were a few questions that we collected. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, so uh, the first one, uh, goes to Yuri. So there was a question uh, regarding um, the, the viewpoint predictive model that, that you have at the end of the presentation, um, yeah. where you try to get rid of basically the dependence on the, the object poses, right? And you introduce the, the change in, um, in, the, in the state X. Um, yeah. So the question is, would it be possible or have you thought about jointly optimizing the policy for these local actions to change the the pose um, so that you know you can maximize the extraction of semantic meaning for the objects, the uh, joint optimization of this. So actually, uh, this could be the next step, uh, but this uh, this would imply uh, this would imply simultaneously learning the model, right? Because we don't have the uh, the model or the uh, space or the Latin space yet. Mm -hmm. So this is another challenge. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, then, um, yeah, on the on the paper, um, the, on the variational encoding of the general adversarial learning for inferring the missing knowledge. Um, so Francesco, uh, there was the question whether the same approach could also be used for multimodal observations, such as RGB image, uh, images, um, or if not, how would the um, approach need to be changed? Uh, yeah, the, the approach in the way it is constructed is really agnostic to the data observation we use. So the first naive approach would be to instantiate a guess model, that, that's what we call it, uh, so a guess model to each of the data type that we have. We, we thought about having a common structure uh, that actually will fork to different data and have a common context contextual model, but the, that is for later stages. So the first thing that we're gonna try is to associate a different independent model for each type of data. Great, thank you. Yep. Um, so then a uh, question for Himangi. Um, so there was the question, how sensitive the approach is to spurious matches? Uh, for the, uh, uh, if we consider the occlusions in the point cloud, then uh, the scene flow, it's, uh, it is able to estimate uh, the flow regard uh, with respect to the point cloud one and uh, if the object is quite occluded, let's say the points are quite sparse in the point cloud, then the uh, scene flow may generate some errors. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions that came up in the meantime? Have a look in the chat. Is there anything else? Okay, great. Then thanks very much, you guys. Thanks everyone for the participation, great.
then uh, we'll come to uh, the final part um, and to the concluding remarks. And uh, I'm passing over to Anelia. I think Abhinav wants to first start. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll briefly say something. Uh, we'd like to first thank the invited speakers for taking the time out of the schedule. Um, we hope we we hope everyone found the workshop as um, exciting and interesting. Um, last but not least, we still have to um, announce the best paper award, and for that. Uh, I'd like to give it over to uh, Anelia. Uh, thank you, Avinav. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the um, winner of the Best Paper Award. It was a tough decision. Um, the award um, uh, is sponsored by Google Research. Uh, and um, we are very happy to announce that the award goes to, drumroll, All right, the award is Self-Supervised Goal Conditioned Policies for Navigation in Unstructured Environments by Travis Manderson, Juan Camilo Gamboa, Stefan Wapnik, Jean-Francois Tremblay, Han King Zhao, Florian Scruti, Dave Major, and Gregory Dudek. Congratulations to all the authors. Um, we thought that um, this work is um, uh, a really great example of innovative uh, application to self-supervised learning uh, and also provides uh, uh, a very impressive real-world results. Um, again, congratulations to uh, the um, authors. Um, and um, to conclude our um, workshop, um, I'd like to thank uh, all our speakers, um, our um, panelists, our presenters, and my co-organizers. Um, it has been a really pleasure to be part of, of this together. Um, I believe self-supervised learning is really key uh, to robotics. It's uh, one of the things that uh, can, can scale uh, because uh, data is plentiful uh, and it is um, our biggest challenge and a very exciting challenge to figure exactly how to harness all this um, uh, amazing um, uh, data and um, standing in the, in the border of robot interact, robots interacting or driving and, and so on within the environment with or without some human help. Um, so um, thanks again, everyone, for your participation. Um, and um, um, I hope you have a, a great um, um, RSS conference.